We're live. Is that so? We're doing a live. We're doing a big old live. What are we going to do on this live, Clytus? Well, seeing as we've set up the title, the thumbnail, the document, and it's what we've prepared to talk about, I think we should talk about more food descriptions in A Song of Ice and Fire. Oh, well, that's a relief. I was getting mighty peckish. Yeah? Uh, quite peckish. I would say starving. Well, we probably shouldn't be streaming then. You should go find food. No, the only nourishment I need is George Martin's luscious food descriptions. The highest form of This art. is honestly why why I want to eat the Winds of Winter, is I'll find the yummest looking food descriptions on the page, peel those pages out, and mm. just gobble them down. Yum, yum, yum. If the Winds of Winter tastes half as good as the food descriptions we're about to read, you will have the best meal of your life when you chow down on that paperback. I, I'm not hopeful that it will taste <laughs> half as good because you know they treat book pages with bleach do they to now? keep them white bleach. i've heard that that's uh, uh got antioxidants <laughs> is that accurate yes yes um folks we are doing a part two to a stream have we ever done a part two to a stream before oh, look it de- it it depends on how strict you're being with some of those terms mm because uh, in our previous live stream, we talked about all of the food descriptions in the first two books of the Game of Thrones books. So now we're going to begin with the third book, A Storm of Swords. And I sh- don't be hopeful that we'll finish it today. I don't think we will. These yeah. are three large books, and we won't get through all of them today. There will probably have to be a part three, all about the cannibalism of a dance with dragons. <laughs> If you like people eating people, boy howdy, have we got a good time for you. But don't worry, there's some weird shit in book three as well that we're going to get into. Thank goodness. So I I would suggest that you maybe eat before listening to this stream. Yeah, things are about to get weird. Increasingly weird. Yeah, so if you're a snacker, maybe get them out of the way first. Yeah, I certainly agree. Um, shall we start with our first food description? I think we shall. It'd be strange to start elsewhere. Want to read it? I do. Our first excerpt comes from Davos 1, A Storm of Swords. When the tide was low, he could sometimes find tiny crabs along the stony strand where he had washed ashore after the battle. This is after the Battle of the Blackwater. They nipped his fingers painfully before he smashed them apart on the rocks to suck the meat from their claws and the guts from their shells. Oh my god. I thought Davos was a nice man. He's a nice old man who gruesomely murders crabs to suck their guts out. Do you think that the crabs ate a little bit of Davos before Davos ate the crabs? Well, you know how these things are in nature. It's a bit of give and take, symbiosis, as it were. You know, mm. the the, <laughs> the the rabbit eats a bit of the lion before the lion can gobble the rabbit. There's a little bit of crab in all of us, <laughs> and there's a little bit of me in every crab. You know, they were nipping his, his fingers with their claws, and, like, for what other reason would a crab be nipping you? It... Davos was merely acting in self-defense. Yeah, that's why he ate those guys. I'm pretty sure the Stormlands are a stand-your-ground now... state. So <laughs> he had... All right. We're right into it today. <laughs> um, now, I, I like crab meat. I'm a fan of crab mm. in general. Mm. The crab stick from the fish and chippery, let's go. Absolutely. Um, however, I've never had raw crab, to my knowledge. And like tiny crabs, like how are you going to be able to get the good bits apart from the bad bits? You yeah, know? these are tiny crabs. The crabs small enough that they're described as nipping at his fingers. Like th- these aren't sizable crabs. These aren't pick them up with both hands crabs. Yeah, these are you've got a handful of them, sort of crabs. It feels like punching down when you eat something that tiny. Like mm. the only meat that I like when eat... a blue whale eats a trillion krill. Yeah, that's like it feels unfair, really. <laughs> I the only honourable way to eat meat is f- to eat animals that have at least, like, a 30% chance of beating me in hand-to-hand combat. Like a chicken? Well, have you- well, chickens get pretty angry. Yeah, pretty... And, like, Especially geese the and wild, ducks. Like a wild game fowl? Oh, yeah. Yeah. R- I mean, an angry rooster is one step away from a velociraptor. So I have no qualms about eating a, a chicken. Okay. Or a cow. Or a, or a 
hog, but a little crab like that, it's punching down. Do you think Davos killing and eating these crabs is kind of a metaphor for his battle that isn't written about, his battle with venereal disease? I thought that was the implication. Mm. I thought that he was trying to um, do some medical treatment on himself. Yes, by by nipping at his fingers, what George is leaving out here, that it's his, it's his 11th finger. <laughs> well, 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 but it would actually be his seventh finger <laughs> because four of Davos's fingers have in fact been removed by Stannis. Well, not the whole things. Well, all right. Well, he's got like half fingers, so they probably only add up to add like up a to collective eight. eight. Yeah, so it's his ninth finger. Okay. So um, it's, gentleman's it's, agreement, he's got nine fingers. Well, yes, this is his ninth finger. Davos definitely makes some bones puns to his <laughs> lovely wife, Maya, doesn't he? <laughs> Do you want to see my bag of bones, babe? No. <laughs> All right, I think that we need to immediately move on from this food description. Well, but first we have to rank it. Obviously. By ranking it. Oh, okay. So I, I agree with you wholeheartedly that tiny crabs are less appealing than big juicy crabs. Yep. Uh, I feel like there's going to be a lot of little shells in there and a lot of little claws in there. And the thing is, the guts of the crabs, I don't think are the bits that are appetizing. I think we're in for the intramuscular flesh rather than, you know, the intestines of the crab. The At- intramuscular, you say? Yeah, why not? Um, Daz- Davos is here eating, the, like, wholesale scooping into mm. these tiny little buggers mm. and just gobbling up what he can find. Obviously, mm. he's starving to death, washed up on a rock after watching his children die in a massive battle. He'll take what he can get. Mm. But... You know, if this was served to me in a restaurant, like, if I'm saying D tier, it's because I'm feeling very nice that day. I, I, I agree. I think there'd also be a lot of sand yep. in with the crabs. Like, uh, I've eaten on the how sand. He's, I don't like sand. It gets everywhere. It gets everywhere. Um, I, I think you'd really need a sort of a slurping motion. Like, do you think this is a... This is, like, he's, like, hoovering his face along the beach, going, <laughs> like, slurping up the tiny crabs. <laughs> Gary, I like how your attempt to move on from this has turned into <laughs> ASMR slurping sounds. I'm so sorry for the slurping. That's a D tier. That's an that's an easy D. If not worse. Oh no, we have to leave room. Oh D- yeah, down the bottom. No, there. it's all downhill from here. Yeah. It's all downhill from here. Uh, our next food description. This is Sansa in King's Landing, and Sansa is having a wonderful lunch with the Tyrells, with Olena Tyrell, the Lady of Queen of Thorns. Um, and Lady Bulwer is also there, who's a little one. And there's a fool called Butterbumps, who's like the Tyrell jester. Love me some Butterbumps. And Butterbumps is doing some mad tomfoolery. He's really earning his keep, this Butterbumps, by doing a performance that involves pretending to eat tiny chickens. So, um, a dozen yellow chicks escaped and began running in all directions. Catch them! Butterbumps exclaimed. Little Lady Bulwer snagged one and handed it to him, whereby he tilted back his head, popped it into his huge rubbery mouth, and seemed to swallow it whole. When he belched, tiny yellow feathers flew out his nose. Lady Bulwer began to wail in distress, but her tears turned into a sudden squeal of delight when the chick came squirming out of the sleeve of her gown and ran down her arm. And then later, Butterbumps popped a whole orange into his mouth, chewed and swallowed, slapped his cheek, and blew seeds out of his nose. (laughs) That's hilarious. That's a great trick. So, a whole orange? A whole orange. It was massive. (laughs) And then fires the seeds out of his nose. Which makes me think, do you think it's possible that Butterbumps is an actual magician? Because... That's the only explanation. (laughs) Because I'm struggling to imagine how a magician would pull this off in And the thing is, life. oranges being quite large as they are, that like this trick would take some time to be... like It would no longer be interesting by the time he had swallowed the orange. How many times would you have to chew a whole orange before you can swallow it? Yeah, this guy has a lot of vitamin C, is what you're mm. saying. <laughs> and as we know, citrus doesn't even grow in this climate. So where That's is right. he getting all Very of this citrus? Very important plot point. <laughs> Um, I, well, I think Butterbumps is Quaith. Do you have any... Magic. Secondary evidence for that? Magic. Magic. Okay. Um, d- sh- should we rate the, the chicken eating? Does that count as a food description? Because he didn't actually eat the chick, I suppose. 
But the orange he did eat. Well, it's... I like oranges. Oranges are like an A-tier food on their own. However, eating one whole, uh, that doesn't sound very appetizing to me. When he's blowing that acidic orange juice through his sinuses, yeah. that's doing some damage. Yeah. Imagine sneezing and tasting orange for the rest of the week. That's a nightmare. Doesn't sound good. That's that's my nightmare. So, I mean, I think that's a C. Yeah. Because it's like, it's impressive, but should you, Butter Bumps? Should you? Did you stop to think about whether you should do that? Ah, he's an entertainer. He has to take risks. This is his craft. This is his pride yeah. and joy. Um, the rest of this uh, entry... Yeah, so the next food description later in this lunch is a conversation between the Queen of Thorns and, like, the waiter or whoever. And so Elena is saying, I am not fond of leeks. Take this broth away and bring me some cheese. Oh, the cheese will be served after the cakes, my lady. The cheese will be served when I want it served, and I want it served now. Do you think I'm hamming that up too much? Do you no, think Elena I think is that's more... exactly how it should sound. Because Elena has a lot of fun bossing people around. Yeah, she's a bit sassy. And this just shows us that Elena is just in charge and cool. Yep. Now, in terms of being a food description, it's just the word cheese. S <laughs> <laughs> I'm there with you. And there was also a hint of cakes, so I was convinced. Uh, the, the mentions of leeks, however. I mean, leeks, you know, perfectly serviceable food, I find. Leeks reek. What's the next description? Um, here, uh, we have Tormund describing some food, I assume, to John in this uh, the first chapter of Storm. Would this be uh, when he's being introduced to Mance? Yeah, John is meeting Mance Raider and Tormund Giant Spain for the first time, and he sees Tormund enjoying some That's food. That's right. A short but immensely broad man sat on a stool, eating a hen off a skewer. Hot grease was running down his chin and into his snow-white beard, but he smiled happily. And he's later referred to as our ferocious, our ferocious chicken eater here. So it's pretty minimal, but there's an entire chicken on a stick, and there's grease running down a chin into a snow-white beard. We've hit all of the George R.R. R. Martin notes. This is George Martin's idea of a good time. He's distilled... <laughs> The craft of food description into this short passage here. He has found what truly matters in life. This is the crux. It's Greece entering pits. I still <laughs> like imagining that alternate timeline where he didn't become a fantasy science fiction author of massive novels, but instead went into the business of writing re restaurant menu entries. A food critic, yeah. I think he'd feel far more fulfilled in life. Yeah. Anyway, how do, how do you feel about a chicken on a stick? I think an entire it, chicken. I think it's an easy A. I think that this is a good time that Tormund is having. Yeah, and like north of the wall, you know, eating an entire chicken off a stick, that's a good meal as far as it goes up there. And it's not easy to get food when you're all gathered together in the Milkwater Valley, mm. right? Like, how many goddamn wildlings are there? There's not a lot to eat in the mountains. So that makes a political point that Tormund is one of the inner circle who has access to all the good food. Absolutely. Out in the camp, they're not eating entire hens off sticks. No hot grease running into their chins. So then in a Bran chapter, we have Bran, you know, connecting magically with his direwolf Summer and, like, Summer eats animals and then Bran through his psychic connection to Summer like experiences the eating of those animals and so Bran remembers the taste of the blood and the raw rich meat and his mouth watered and that probably doesn't count as a food description but then a little bit later uh, Mira catches fish and frogs so they used Mira's helmet for a cooking pot chopping up the catch into little cubes and tossing in some water and some wild onions Hodor had found to make a froggy stew. It wasn't as good as deer, but it wasn't bad either. That's kind of cute. I like that they used the helmet as yeah, a pot. That's very nice. resourceful. I think that's mentioned elsewhere. I think the hound does it sometime. Mm. No. Am I misremembering? I think it's mentioned somewhere else. But um, the term froggy stew... Like, when I think about it as a food, it's not fantastic, but, like, it's just a really cute saying, isn't it? Froggy stew. I Maybe I, it's just the word froggy. 
I knew a guy who went by that name. Yeah, Froggy Stew. Yeah, like Disco he was Stew. My math teacher. Oh, yeah. Um, that uh, that was a lie. Um, I like that it's cut into cubes. I like that the little frog cubes. I I'm trying to imagine using a helmet as a cooking pot though. Like if there are eye holes or like a mouth hole. I'm imagining it's just a coif. A coif. Hang on, what's the word I'm thinking of? Like a half helm? Like a like just a metal a hemisphere that goes atop your head? Maybe Mira wears an actual cooking pot as a helmet. That could, like like, the like helmet. Brock in Pokemon. Exactly. Yeah. And the helmet is just a secondary function. The main purpose is as a cooking yeah. pot. I think this is a B. Like, since Brand specifically says that it's not as good as deer, it's obviously not great. But the froggy stew and the cubes and the helmet, it's very cute. I really like how um, they've clearly gone out of their way here to um, present it. Mm. To, like, they've taken the time and the effort to make fish and frogs something a bit more exciting. It's very aesthetic. It's very Instagrammable. Uh, yeah. It's very vibe. And so I think it's a B tier. Nice. What's our next one? Well, Jamie finds himself at the end of the kneeling man. Would this be uh, during uh, Brienne's escorting him? Uh, with Cleos. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Little Mr. Frey. Poor Mr. Frey. Um, the man who wasn't an innkeep charged... I assume that's in reference to a man who wasn't an innkeep. Yeah, I think it's because it's like during the war and like the original innkeep died. And right. so it's like just showing the insecurity. And so he's just like, yeah, some guy who's decided that he's in charge of the inn. Ah. Um, charred three huge horse steaks and fried the onions in bacon grease, which almost made up for the stale oat cakes. Jamie and Cleo drank ale, Brienne a cup of cider. Three huge horse steaks. So ne never had horse. No, never? No. For someone who talks a <laughs> higher than average amount about horses, I'm shocked by that. Well, I just respect them too much. <laughs> See, I know, they could definitely beat me in hand-to-hand -hand combat, combat probably every time. They don't so. have hands, Gladys. True, and that's why I was so confused about um, some of those horses carrying swords around. Yeah, well, look, I, it, it's all explained in Gladys's masterful <laughs> videos about the secret horses of A Song of Ice and Fire. I'm really blown away by the response to that one. <laughs> we'll have to put a link in the description if you haven't already seen it. And if you have already seen it, see it a second time. Uh, would you eat this, Glidus? Um, well, I imagine there's not really much else going around. I think the onions fried in bacon grease That's sound fantastic. Yeah. I think the ale and the cider is probably a good time. Probably fine, yeah. The oat cakes, meh. That's a pass from me, but, you know, they're not the worst thing in the world. Stale oat cakes, you know. It's basically a wheat bix, isn't it? Yeah. What's a singular wheat bix supposed to be called? A wheat bix. Wheat bix. Yeah, wheat okay. bix. One wheat bix, many wheat bix. Very good. Uh, I feel like it's a B. Yeah, I like froggy stewed here. Yeah, I would eat it. I would enjoy it, but it's not perfect. I wouldn't learn maths from it. That's yeah, that's right. Um, our next food description is an Arya chapter, and someone I don't remember who says. Roast rabbit on a spit would be quickest if you've got a hunger. Or, might be, you'd like it stewed with ale and onions. This is a hypothetical food description then, isn't it? I suppose so. I think it would be a good time. Yeah. Rabbit, onion. Rabbit, ale, onions. Sure. It's a bit nondescript, though. Yeah. Should we just make it a C? In fact, I think all of the food out in the wild so far in this book has been really plain... Like, there's been no mention of spices or honey. It's almost as though George is about to hit us with some extremely lavish food descriptions to mm. contrast the minimal ones. Because then, at Acorn Hall, Arya has a meal that is plain but filling. Mutton and mushrooms, brown bread, peas pudding, and baked apples with yellow cheese. Yes, Arya, you gobble that up. This is the best meal Arya's had in a while. A long while, you might reckon. Sounds pretty good to me. It sounds pretty great. Mutton, yep. Mushrooms, yep. Brown bread. The colour of bread doesn't really bother me one way or the other, but it's bread in it. 
I, I, I'm, I have questions about the peas pudding. I don't really know what the peas pudding entails. Well, let's find out. Baked apples sound great. Yellow yep. cheese sounds great. I feel like that's a... See, I'm aware of the existence of peas pudding via nursery rhymes, but it, they, ne- they never cult. elaborate on peas pudding cult. what exactly that is. Nine days A savoury pudding dish made of boiled legumes, typically split yellow peas, with water, salt, and spices. Yellow peas? Yeah. Although I imagine green peas would also suffice. Wait, so, so pudding? Yeah. It's just... It's just it's peas. It's peas. It's, it's just it's it's peas. peas. It's baby food. Oh, this is when I. This is like when I found out that wine is just grapes. <laughs> I was outraged. What are you talking about? Notes of blueberry and oak. It's, it's, just it's grapes. grapes. It's grape it's, juice. It's grapes. It's Welch's. Outrageous. I think that's an A. Yeah, it sounds pretty good. Like I'm just. If I'm full enough, I'm not really engaging in the peas pudding. That doesn't. It doesn't sound good. So I imagine if you've grown up on it it's great it's like a childhood fantasy of for you but to people learning of it in their adulthood it's just fucking weird i've got i've got nothing against a pile of peas just don't call it a pudding what what lunacy is it to call well, peas a pudding doesn't pudding basically just mean like a kind of gooey thing you can eat i think that's very reductive i expect no, a lot more chaotic of chaotic it's a chaotic definition no it's i it's too you're a pudding purist then that's what's going on i here. yes i insist that in this day and age pudding means something <laughs> and i will defend it to my last uh and then daenerys is in astapor uh and she's talking to a slave owner in this strange city uh, that has a very different culture to her own. So Krasnis says that beef, pfft, that's food for unwashed savages. I love the way George has chosen to write the sound of pfft. <laughs> it works, doesn't it? Yeah. He didn't have to put a slur in there, though, did he? And then a little bit later, uh, Krasnis goes on to say that, oh, Doquor's pit has a fine folly scheduled for the evening. A bear and three small boys. One boy will be rolled in honey, one in blood, and one in rotting fish. And she may wager on which the bear will eat first. That's disgusting. This guy who just said that beef is savagery (laughs) is feeding literal children to bears. Well, bears are savages, aren't they? So Krasnis' involvement is purely incidental. Exactly. Um, now, so this is cannibalism, <laughs> but, but well, you're asking me to judge how appetizing <laughs> these small boys would be r- rolled in honey, blood or rotting fish. Right. I suppose I hadn't s- thought Didn't it really think that through, through entirely, but yes, no, we are, we are judging how delicious we think that these people would mm, be. Mm, mm. Uh um, do, well, they don't specify what kind of blood the second boy is rolled in. I think more importantly, they don't specify what kind of boys they are. Are these athletic young ones or are they <laughs> plump little um, toddlers? This is just getting less appetizing. Sorry, I shouldn't have <laughs> posed that question. I, I mean, the honey has to be less bad than the rotting fish. Yeah, although then you're like, mmm, delicious because you're eating honey. But then it's like, oh, wait a minute. It's a human child. So you feel even (laughs) worse about enjoying it if you see where I'm going with this. There's no winning here. Are we including the bear as part of the food description? No, I think think I'm the bear here. Because the bear is... (laughs) Because the bear is going to get honey and blood and, and fish on it. I think... The 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 honeyed I think that honeyed bear would sound great. Is all I'm saying. Probably, yeah. Okay, look. Is there anything? Oh, am I eating the bear now? Well, I'm just yeah. That's what I'm oh, asking. Yeah, is good. the bear included? Absolutely. Uh, if if that's what we're grading, perfectly fine with that. Well, the bear definitely in- increases the but yeah. but taken as a whole, the the children and the blood and the fish. <laughs> <laughs> that's an F. Yeah. Wow. Oh boy! Oh boy! Astapor, what a place! Yeah, wow. Slavers Bay, man. George is really giving us some morally ambiguous characters yeah, in this very story. Yeah, grey of Krasnitz. Famously morally grey series, The Song of Ice and Fire, really giving us, my God. Uh, let's go as far away as possible from Astapor, 
uh, and come to Adelaide. Bran and Mira and Jojen and Hodor traveling north towards the wall. He pictured her safe in White Harbor with Rickon and Shaggy Dog, eating eels and fish and hot crab pie with Fat Lord Manderley. That sounds great. It does. We talked about hot crab pie last time and how absurd it is that I've never had it. I, that sounds wonderful. I think we should make one on stream. Mm. Oh, yeah. I think that would be an enormously good time. We're pivoting to a cooking channel now. Yep, pivoting I mean, I all kind the of way have around. to at some point. Xbox 360 <laughs> pivoting right all the way around to being just binging with babish. I, if you're eating hot crab pie with Lord Manderley, you know that it's going to be the highest quality of seafood available. That's true. Uh, but at the same time, there's like a 5% chance that, that any pie... Children, yeah. that, so that there's a risk of cannibalism. Mm. But you know it's going to be quality. Delicious human flesh. Yum. The best around. I don't know, I feel like I'd be able to pretty easily d- distinguish between crab meat and my son's. I have not eaten a human before. So I mean, just I... by looking at it. Yeah. Well, it's in a pie is the trouble. The pie is the disguise. Well, crab flesh is, you know, yeah, it's completely weird. different to any mammal flesh. So it is. Um, I think it's a. I think it's a B. If only because personally, I'm not a big eel guy. Yeah. Have Have you eaten eel? I don't think I have eaten eel. But to be a pedant, eels are fish. So saying eels and fish is a bit redundant. Yeah, and I bet you think birds are dinosaurs too. You pedant. They are. And then they meet a man of the Lidl clan who offers Bran and company oat cakes and blood sausage and a swallow of ale from a skin he carried. But he never offered his name, nor did he ask theirs. And then the Lidl leaves in the morning, and the Lidl leaves a sausage for them and a dozen oat cakes folded up neatly in a green and white cloth. Some of the cakes had pine nuts Ooh. baked in them, and some had blackberries. What lovely hospitality. What a great guy. Mm. So I really like that example of northern hospitality, of this man who gives strangers um, probably the nicest food like around for miles, and he doesn't even bother. Like It doesn't matter what their names are. It doesn't matter who you are. I, th- I think the implication is that the little recognises that this is Bran Stark, the, the you know, heir to Winterfell. You don't think he'd do this for any travellers? Eh, probably not. I I suspect not. Um, but it is a lovely gesture. I, I I really like the way George writes this bit. Like I feel like I feel like when George writes Bran, since Bran is so young, like he subtly does a little bit different grammar to fit with him being so young. Like I think that you know, like the sentence, some of the cakes had pine nuts baked in them and some had blackberries. Like I think there's sort of a childish yeah. like naivety to like the structure of the grammar. Absolutely. There. And thinking that eels is uh distinct from fish. <laughs> <laughs> what is Maester Lewin doing? If he's not teaching <laughs> Bran Stark correct taxonomy, how is Bran gonna be a good Winterfell lordling? It's true. Outrageous stuff. I, th- I mean, who are we to talk? We didn't know what capons were last time. <laughs> <laughs> Fair. Um, I think that's an A. Yeah, it sounds great. Yeah. It's a- it sounds a bit, like, desserty. But yeah, but I'm, I'm an eight-year-old boy in this scenario. Mm. I'm, I, I, like, someone leaves me just a bunch of cakes he had. Yeah. All good. Thanks, mate. Well, it's going to get complicated if we try to do this from the perspective of the people in the descriptions. That's going to make it... um, Yeah. (laughs) Especially when we get into the uh, warging food (laughs) descriptions, and it's uh, what the direwolves are eating. Anyway, so the next food description. uh, Davos Seaworth, our good onion knight, is now a prisoner in the cells on Dragonstone, because Davos did a little oopsie where he tried to murder the Red Priestess Melisandre. Um, and uh, that did not end well for him. So now he's uh, he's in the cells. And, of course, what George spends his time describing in this chapter is all of the food that Davos is eating in prison. Uh, so he was given hot garlic broth to drink and milk of the poppy to take away his aches and shivers. Before very long, the coughing stopped. The blisters vanished, and his broth had chunks of whitefish in it, and carrots and onions as well. 
and one day he realized he felt stronger than he had since Black Beether shattered, who was his ship in the Battle of the Blackwater. Once a day, uh, once a day brought Davos a bowl of oaten porridge. Sometimes he sweetened it with honey or poured in a bit of milk. Mm. He would bring Davos plates of meat and mash or fish stew, and once even half a lamprey pie. The lamprey was so rich he could not keep it down, but even so, it was a rare treat for a prisoner in a dungeon. I'll say. He he doesn't know the names of his jailers, so he gives his jailers right. names of his own. The short, strong one he called Porridge. The stooped, sallow one, Lamprey, for the pie. He marked the passage of days by the meals they brought. So this is an awful lot of detailed description of food while Davos is in yeah, prison, I, isn't like, it? Yeah, like, if George is trying to paint a picture of this, prison, of this prison, really I'm just getting the kind of restaurant he was thinking about that day. <laughs> right. Although it does, like, make you think about uh, Davos's stat- status as a prisoner of status is here. Like, he's not being treated like a prisoner, is he? He's, he's like a hotel guest, but he has it, like, under house arrest, really. Yeah. Yeah, that's something we see with a bunch of people, like, noble people who are imprisoned. I mean, not that Davos is noble, but he's, like, politically important. Uh, it's like when Ariane is imprisoned and she's getting all this nice food and um, people are treated differently. I heard it's called feudalism. Hmm. What's that all about then? Who knows? I think the great thing here is that like we've we've heard what Davos's life was like before Stannis, and this is so much better. So like, and he's a prisoner at this point. Yeah, Davos as a prisoner is eating better than Davos as a free commoner. Yeah. Uh, would Would you want to eat this? The hot garlic broth and the heroin. The... The, the heroin the milk of the poppy yeah no that's a good addition <laughs> the white makes dish. any meal better really <laughs> Car- maybe yeah. carrots and onions oaten porridge with honey and milk meat and mash fish stew lamprey pie I'll pass on the lamprey pie again fish pie doesn't really doesn't really work for me I'd, I'd smash a fish pie yeah um meat and mash doesn't say what kind of meat doesn't really matter does it I'm suspicious of any meat that's described as just <laughs> meat. meat. Well, you're not into a meat pie. Well, I I uh, I enjoy a meat pie where you know what kind of meat it is. Okay, I do. It does sound like if I'm in prison and they're feeding me this, I'm really happy about it. Honestly, just the hot garlic broth oh, sounds, sounds wonderful. Great, yeah. I I think this is like a B. The B stands for delicious. Yeah. Next one. Uh, what do we have here? Daenerys. Oh, we're in Astapor now. Um, Sir Jorah barked a command and the trade goods were brought forward. Six bales of tiger skins, 300 bolts of fine silk, jars of saffron, jars of myrrh, jars of pepper and curry and cardamom, an onyx mask, 12 jade monkeys, casks of ink in red and black and green, a box of rare black amethysts, a box of pearls, a cask of pitted olives stuffed with maggots, a dozen casks of pickled cave fish. Glidus, would you like to eat pitted olives stuffed with maggots? So when I started the, that particular clause of this run-on sentence, um, I thought, ooh, a cask of pitted olives. Olives, uh, eh, you know, we'll <laughs> see. Stuffed with maggots. Mm. Hmm. Hmm. I'll, I'll pass on those and skip straight to the 12 jade monkeys. Yum, num, 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 num. That's going to be a lot harder to eat. It's really I, bad on your teeth. My my theory with the pitted olives stuffed with maggots is that the maggots are a bug, not a feature, but they're trying to act a as bug. though. They're like, oh, no, it's not that maggots infested our olives. No, we deliberately stuffed our olives with maggots to make them more delicious on purpose. It's a textural variation. It's called heterogeneity. And what about the pickled cave fish? Would you eat a pickled cave fish? I'd give it a go, yeah. Why not? I think anything will taste okay if it's pickled enough. Mm. But I don't think cave fish are what I be I want to be eating. Um, saffron's a great spice. I don't know if... Isn't saffron more for colour? It's for both. Okay. Well, yeah, the, the curry and cardamom is nice. Where do you think curry comes from in the world of ice and fire? Um... East. <laughs> hmm. George is very vague about the yeah. geography sometimes. Yeah. 
Um, I'm I'm gonna give the olives with maggots and pickled cavefish. That's a that's like a D. I'm thinking D as well. Yeah, like we could go harder on it, but honestly, like I don't want to knock it until I've tried it. Like maybe it's great. Maybe maggots are delicious. Yeah, I mean, I mean there are like grubs and stuff that are nice. Although I feel like maggots is a bit different. Like yeah, because maggots. I, well, there's like a. I don't know if it's ubiquitous association between maggots and rotting stuff, but I think it's a pretty strong association that most humans are probably going to get at some point in their lives. Yeah, I think it's not controversial to think maggots are a bad idea. Yeah. So then uh, Sansa suddenly gets married to Tyrion Lannister. She has a wedding sprung on her, uh, and it sucks, and she's traumatized. And I think it's really interesting that this is a very rare situation where a major wedding, an important wedding, does not have a detailed food description. Sansa tasted none of the food. She wanted it to be done, and she dreaded its end. So I think that just tells you, like, where Sansa's at. We don't Mm. get a lavish food description because Sansa's in a horrifying situation being married to this And George, for the first time in his literary career, realises that now would not be the time to go on about the opulent food at the feast here the only thing he held himself back this one time the only thing that could turn george off his lunch was a forcible child wedding to Tyrion. so you know you just know that he wrote this like two hours after lunch (laughs) yeah must have been uh so yeah not really a food description more of an observation i'll take that as an i'll take that as a statement not a question (laughs) What's next? Um, well, it appears that we're now at Stony Sept with Arya. Uh, yeah, well, yeah, and I don't remember the context exactly of what's going on here, honestly, but there's a fat man... Oh, God, did you have to put this in? <laughs> <laughs> well, I did question whether this counts as a food description, but... It invokes food. The fat man opened his eyes. The skin around them was so red, they looked like boiled eggs floating in a dish of blood. Now that I think about it, what kind of blood? (laughs) Whose blood? Because if this is like cow's blood or like lamb blood, maybe, maybe, I think maybe (laughs) we have to assume that it's that it's human blood, given that it's in a human. But it's a metaphor. Yeah, actually, it's a simile. Yeah. So these are like prisoners in cages, who. Uh, yeah, they, like, killed people. They were, like, rapists and murderers, so these people have been put into crow cages. Of course. And, yeah, they're not doing very well. Um, and then a woman is joking around with Tom of Seven Streams, and so she says, Oh, I'll roast some mutton for your friends, and an old dry oh rat God. for you. Why did you have to describe it in such a detail? Why not just say rat? That's already enough. I already, like, know what I'm getting if you just say rat. But the you had to qualify it twice. <laughs> yeah, and a, dr- a dry rat oh, is not bad enough. An old rat is not a, a dry rat. A dry... Oh, no. An old dry rat. There is another rat. This is not the only rat food description we're getting, by oh, the I'm way. Sure. We're going to get to more rats. The thing is, conceptually, maybe rat could be fine. Mm-hmm. But she had to go ahead and call it old. Is it was it an old rat? Like was it a three year old rat when it died, or are you saying like it died two weeks ago? This is well, the question that goes through my head when I read that I'm about to eat an old rat. That's a great question because like, I mean, this rat has dried out. Oh, this rat has been made dry. Rat dry Did is they... not a natural state hey, for a is rat. Is it jerky? Rat jerky? That sounds kind of better to I me. I kind of tried that. Yeah, I would rather rat jerky. I My question is, where is this rat coming from? Like, if there was a nice, like, clean rat farm, like, great, fine. But if this is, like, a rat from a sewer, if this is one of these, like, like Manhattan rats that comes up the sewer pipes and bites people on the bum and gives them, like, exciting new flavors of rabies, that that is a no from me. This one's called Manhattan Twist. Uh, so I I think th- is the this Broadway a- blast. Is this our first? The bro- is this our first F? No, no, no. It's not our first F. You said that very confidently. Well, we didn't. Didn't we do one just like half an hour ago? 
Wasn't there a cannibalism one that was F? Oh, yeah. Well, yeah, right. No. But you're saying it's it's an F. It's just not our first F. Well, hang on. There's mutton. <laughs> oh, no. I like that, how it's uh, some mutton for your friends and an old dry rat for you. Yeah, right? I just enjoyed yeah, yeah. the characterization. Yeah. There. People are ragging on Tom all the time. It's I mean, fun. So this is a joke. Mm. This is a hypothetical. <laughs> it's an F. She successfully came up with something I really do not want to eat. She and did like it. pair that with. Uh, did we even individually rank the boiled eggs floating in a dish of blood? Yeah, that, I mean, obviously that's an F. Yeah, eyeballs in blood is uh, that's a no no. So then Jamie Lannister gets his hand cut off by the brave companions, and what does he eat? Um. Well, they fed him a mush of oats, horse food, but he forced down every spoon. He ate again at even fall in the next day. Live, he told himself harshly. So he's eating horse food. Yeah, barely a food description, but I mean, a mush of oats. We've had oat cakes, we've had oat and porridge. How do we feel about mush? A mu- well, I think mush is one of the least appetizing ways to prepare a dish. Mm. And oats, like this is for horses, they probably haven't taken too much care in rolling them, have they? There's probably bugs in there. Yeah. That's an E. E. There's no human flesh invoked, so it can't be F. So then uh, Tyrion is walking around King's Landing in the aftermath of the Battle of the Blackwater, and he sees that a lot of people are starving, the markets are crowded, but the prices are shockingly high. Six coppers for a melon, a silver stag for a bushel of corn, a dragon for a side of beef or six skinny piglets... Yet there was no lack of buyers. Gaunt men and haggard women crowded around every wagon and stall. So that's not really a food description. That's just like the context of Mm -hmm. like there's still people starving around here. And so then Tyrion goes for a meeting with Simon Silvertongue, the singer, uh, who Tyrion decides to murder because Simon is like blackmailing Tyrion. Uh, And what does Bronn suggest be done with Simon? There's a pot shop I know in Flea Bottom. Why am I making Bronn sound like... (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> There's a pot shop I know in Flea Bottom makes a savoury brawl of brown. All kinds of meat in it, I hear. Um, so Bron there is suggesting that they uh, kill Simon and have people eat him. I don't want it. <laughs> yeah, cheeky bit of cannibalism. Already. Already with the cannibalism. Um, I, I don't like it. I, I don't, I don't want to eat that. I don't want to eat it either. Because, I mean, if Simon's going in there, I wonder if other other people are in there too. Yeah, like, if they can just pull that off without with, with nary a second thought. What is the security in this bowl of brown kitchen? Is there, like, a back entrance that they're all just walking in and throwing corpses into the pot Do every they five minutes? Do walk in through the back, three large men carrying Simon's corpse in and just dunk him in the massive broth they've got going on? Or do they kill him there? Oh, I like that idea. So, like, they say, oh, we've brought the new kitchen hand to help chop at the bowl of brown. They take him out, backslit his throat, and just dunk him in. Well, well, no, they say, now, Simon, could you please clean the inside of the pot? (laughs) (laughs) But, but, me lord, it's still boiling. (laughs) Quick, now, Uh that's how we clean it. Here's your scrubbing brush, hop in. This is dark. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, that's an F. Uh... And then... uh, Oh, hold on. What about the wedding? Well, yeah, this again is more of a observation. And it's like it made explicit there the link between um, economy and uh, And cuisine. Politics and food, yeah. Yeah, Yeah, because they're they're, they're planning the wedding between King Joffrey Baratheon and Marjorie Tyrell. And Cersei's pledged the crown to pay half the costs of Joff's wedding, which includes 77 bloody courses... A thousand guests, a pie full of doves, singers and jugglers. And Tywin says, Extravagance has its uses. We must demonstrate the power and wealth of Castle Rock for all the realm to see. I think that's probably the most uh, cogent the time we've seen this point made, uh, is when Tywin just out and says, yeah, no, food is useful in uh, making people think that you're cool. Yeah, it's like that famous line in The Great Gatsby where Gatsby says, The curtains are blue because I'm sad. 
That's right. I love it when the author just explains yeah. the metaphor. F. For Scott us. Fitzgerald, famously uh, transparent with his metaphors. That's right. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so that's why they're having all the food. It's to show off wealth and to assert power. Now that you mention that, I kind of want curtains that change colour with my emotion. Ooh. That's cool. Because like, we have mood rings. Yeah. What if we had mood decor? Is there a kick- is there a shitty Kickstarter that <laughs> addresses these needs? I bet there is. I mean, you could get your smartwatch to like judge your mood from your heart rate. Or you could and just stuff. like tell Siri how you're feeling at the moment. <laughs> okay, Google, I'm sad. <laughs> <laughs> oh no. Um. Hey Alexa, put on the angry lights. <laughs> So then everything turns to a bad time uh, with the Night's Watch ranging beyond the wall uh, because the zombie men uh, attack and then everyone runs away and some of the survivors of the Fist of the First Men run down to Craster's Keep uh, and uh, they're hungry. There's a lot of dudes, they're very scared, they're very angry, they're very cold, and they're all cooped up in Craster's Keep. And, you know, just as I'm saying this, it reminds me of uh, Winterfell in A Dance with Dragons, when all of the Northerners mm. are crowded into Winterfell. And just that feeling of tension, just that feeling of, the, like, the claustrophobic, cooped-up men in the castle with really not enough similar. food. And the tension builds up inexorably to mm. violence. Yeah. This is like a little microcosm of what happens in dance. And it's kind of also a case of over time, the stress and um, destitution of winter moves further south. True. Yeah. And I wonder if one day we'll see the same sort of scenes in the Riverlands. In, in, in the Landing. Twins, in King's Landing, maybe even Storm's End in Highgarden. Yeah. No, yeah, no, that's a great point. Yeah, it's like this spreading... This spreading situation. Thanks. I have to make a great point once every couple of months. <laughs> uh, Just statistically. <laughs> if we say enough things at random, we will accidentally say something. We're kind of running monkeys on typewriters here. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Why do we think? Why do you? Th why do they think we do these streams for so long? <laughs> Gives us the maximum number of throws at the dartboard to accidentally hit something. Yeah, that's why we leave the clip feature enabled is so you can find the one time where we hit the bullseye or the triple 20, which I don't know why the bullseye is the most like well-known place on the dartboard when the triple 20 is worth more points. Anyway, <laughs> um, what are we eating here at Craster's Keep? Would you like to read? Um, a ragged score of black brothers squatted on the floor or sat on rough-hewn benches, drinking cups of the same thin onion broth and gnawing on chunks of hard bread. They all needed more food. The men had been grumbling for days. Clubfoot Carl kept saying how Craster had, them, had, to, ha had to have a hidden larder. <clears throat> and then, I suppose this is later on, John remembers um, Three Finger. Oh, should we rank that separately? Yeah, I think we should. Yeah. So what do you think of the thin onion broth and chunks of hard bread? Uh, well, that sucks. And it sucks, especially in comparison to Three Finger Hobbs' thick cream of wheat mm. with a big spoon of butter melting in the middle and a dollop of honey besides. Fuck yeah, Hob. It sounds like a like a like a weight gaining potion. If you want to get like the most calories as possible <laughs> in Castle Black, if you're like preparing for a long winter, Dolores Ed is bodybuilding this summer. <laughs> He's bulking for the winter <laughs> with the cream of wheat and butter and honey. Yeah, that sounds. I, I think that's an A. Is yeah. that an A? Yeah, good job, Hob. Um, but yeah, they're getting none of that. Yeah, in no. Craster's Cape. Thin onion broth, like. I, I feel as though D tier is where we're just going to put normal food that sucks. I mean, look, put it this way. Is thin onion broth oh. so bad? Or can you think of it as water with some onion? So from our modern perspective, I think thin onion broth, you've ruined water. <laughs> but like in a medieval setting, water is unsafe. I think you've merely enhanced some onions through the addition <laughs> of H2O. <laughs> You reckon? But 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 also they are gnawing on chunks of hard bread. Yeah. This bread is so hard that you can't even just like chew it. You have to gnaw on it. Like some sort of woodland rodent. It's bad for your teeth. Yeah. It's good for their teeth because their teeth continuously grow. 
Are they we, don't stop. Are growing. we still talking about woodland rodents? No, Night's Watchmen. Oh, oh, are they like? Yeah, <laughs> they got a bit of that squirrel blood. They're That's squirrel squirrels. And if they changes. don't gnaw on enough hard bread, then their teeth grow too far and they hit their foreheads. Well, and then they decapitate themselves yeah. with their own canines. Now we are yeah. joking, but that is one hell of a dollar a said way to die. I I think Ed pro- must have a monologue in there somewhere about that. <laughs> so where are we putting this? I think D. I agree. But the situation evolves, and all of these Night's Watchmen are complaining and saying that Craster has food, he's just not giving it to the hungry Night's Watchmen. The day we leave, he'll tap a keg of mead and sit down to feast on ham and honey, and he'll laugh at us, out starving in the snow. Um, and then, oh yeah, I think... Let's rank that first, I think. Uh, that Well, that sounds great, doesn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah, A. Yeah. I feel, I feel like I'm a bit off ham, but I feel like the mead and the honey is great. Well, as um as J.L. Mormont says in the show, mm. um, how many days must a man be expected to start with ham? They, well, there you go. I'm on your side. Jaw yeah. might have subliminally incepted yeah, me with I'm that, I'm with actually. him there, too. Like, I like ham, but it's like, I can't have it every bloody meal, can I? I think the habitual uh, ham in your sandwich situation mm. that a lot of people have, it's not great. I mean, you've seen those studies on, like, uh, bowel cancer and processed meats. Have I? Uh, we all have. Have oh, okay. we not? <laughs> ham's just ham's just not great. Mm. I like salami. It's just not great. This this is your health tips with Glidus and Alt Shift X segment. Just not great. A finger in the bum. <laughs> um, that's a... <laughs> To round off the health tips section. And so the Night's Watchmen continue to complain. Well, Bannon's dead. Bannon's dead. And they're burning his corpse. They're burning his corpse. And Ed says, I never knew Bannon could smell so good. His tone was morose as ever. I'm trying, book. I'm trying. I had half a mind to carve a slice off him. If we had some apple sauce, I might have done it. Pork's always best with apple sauce, I find. So we've got, got a bit of cannibalism contemplation. Now, Ed's a bit of a jokester like that. He likes to, you know, push boundaries. He's a bit edgy, that Ed. Ed. Well, well, he talked about um, drinking wine that a person had drowned in, Yep, didn't he? Yep. It's not the first time he's talked about some sort of cannibalism or cannibalism adjacent. It's a common source of humour for him. Yeah, yeah. The the, The classic cannibalism jokes. Everyone loves those. Would you eat Bannon with applesauce? Oh, uh, look, no, if I knew he was Bannon. But if I mistakenly believed it to be pork, mm. I don't know. And that's what's upsetting about this. It really depends on what part of the person, doesn't it? Mm. Does it? I would think so. Like, I would think that different parts of a uh, human would taste different. Also depends on the human. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I would not eat Bannon with applesauce. Okay. I don't want it. And so, uh, they cook a horse, and it, the horse meat, the charred horse meat, dripped with grease as Craster's wives turned the spits above the fire pit, and the smell of it set his mouth to watering again. But that reminded him of Bannon. Oh, man. And there's some loaves of bread going around. Uh, but then Garth keeps saying there should be hams. There were pigs last time we came here. I bet he's got hams hid someplace. Smoked and salted hams and bacon too. Sausage. Sausage. <laughs> Sausage. <laughs> That's how I imagine a man called Dirk sounding. The long black ones, they're like rocks they keep for years. I bet he's got a hundred hanging in some cellar. <laughs> what kinds of rocks are long and black? <laughs> I think Dirk's losing his fucking mind, honestly. You're going to have to stay consistent with that Dirk voice. Yeah, yeah, all good, all good. In all of many Dirk... In all of Dirk's many <laughs> famous Dirk quotes, quotes in The Song of Ice and Fire. Oats, suggested Olo Lopand. Corn! Bar- corn! Said Mormon Spraven <laughs> with a flap of the wings. Corn! Corn! Enough! Said Lord Commander Mormont over the bird's raucous calls. Corn! Be, <laughs> be quiet! <laughs> All of you. This is folly. Apples, said Garth of Greenaway. Barrels and barrels of crisp autumn apples. There are apple trees out there. I saw them. Dried berries. Cabbages. Pine nuts. Corn. <laughs> Fucking hell. 
Salt mutton. There's a sheepfold. He's got casks and casks of mutton laid by. You know he does. Right, and this is like the last conversation that happens before the mutiny begins. The isn't violence it? breaks out. Yeah. So th- this scene to me is hilarious. Yeah. Like, I imagine this, you know, in like a musical when like characters are like stepping towards Yeah, like someone, someone comes out of the chorus. <laughs> Just to say their one line and then step back into the chorus. Yeah, it's like this choreographed <laughs> thing that's like leading up to and violence. And there's some vamping. Like... Boom, 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 boom. Two loaves of bread. Boom, boom. Cabbages. <laughs> yeah, it's like building up to a song. Except in this case, the song is the murder of Commander <laughs> Joe Momot. It's very comedic. I also think it's really funny that they're fantasizing about really benign shit. Yeah, like aim high, you know? Yeah, like if not you Craster's long black rock like <laughs> sausage. Not sure about that one, Dirk. Oh well, yeah, I mean look, these are these are like simple dudes who have not experienced the luxuries yeah. of life and like this is all they want is the basic stuff. Their wildest dreams are barrels of crisp autumn apples. Cabbages. Cabbages. Um so I, I don't know, are we gonna rate the imagined food imagined by these would-be mutineers sure i think the pine nuts the cabbages yeah. the berries the apples i yeah, mean it all sounds, sounds good, good yeah. except for the long black rock hard sausage yeah that's to take it down a little i i think that the uh, mormon's raven corn cheering these people on by saying corn 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 clearly shows that blood raven is controlling the raven and is trying to encourage the mutineers and wants jill mormont dead because blood raven wants john snow to become the new lord commander and that can only happen if jill mormont is dead the problem with what you just said is i genuinely have no clue whether you're fucking around or not neither do i (laughs) i stopped knowing that a long time ago (laughs) Cause, Cause, the Raven definitely does. Oh, get someone's John... controlling the Raven. So, Come John, on. the Raven got John elected later in the story. The Raven t- plays an active role. Well, whoever put the Raven in the kettle got John elected. But the Raven said, "Snow, John, Snow." Yeah. While sitting on John during the election, immediately before he becomes elected. Yeah. So that being the case, it's not that crazy to think that the Raven wanted Jaw dead. I completely agree. Which is all the more hilarious that Jaw has been feeding and looking after this Raven for ages. And yeah. then Blood Raven being a stone cold killer causes the murder. He does a bit of trolling. He's a that's that's Blood Raven's whole arc. He does a bit of trolling. He's a, just a mischievous ne'er do well. <laughs> He's a little nerd. He's a trickster. <laughs> I think it's a it's a B. Yeah. Uh, should we do some super chats? I think we shall. How far through the book are we? Uh, like halfway through Storm, I think. Okay. Yeah, that that's good then. Yeah. Um, I think if you get there. Uh. <laughs> I'm gonna read the next food description <laughs> while you do that. Okay. <laughs> so. Uh, Lamprey in the prisons of Dragonstone, Davos gets a beef and bacon pie and a flagon of mead. And Lamprey is, of course, his little nickname for one of the jailers in Dragonstone. Um, a beef and bacon pie, I think, sounds like a good time. A flagon of mead sounds like a good time. It's not overly descriptive, though, so I feel like that's a B. I also feel like it's possible to put too much meat in a pie. Beef and bacon. Yeah, it's... A bit too much. Uh, it can work. Depends on how small the bacon bits are. What Do you think it's like a turducken situation? Like, do you think they have fed a cow a bunch of pigs? No. Or more, maybe more realistically, they have fed a bunch of cows to a pig. That is more realistic. Although, I'm pretty sure all, like, traditionally herbivorous animals, um, like, aren't strictly... They're, they're not ideologically vegan is what i'm getting yeah at. yeah they're herbivorous by tradition yeah. not by well they're herbivorous by circumstance i think is more the point mm. um streamlabs is being a bit of a weirdo so the youtube studio is probably our best bet cool there they are do we want to put that on screen do you think i think there's no problem doing that yeah i think there's no problem yeah doing well that. i'll let you handle that uh, so thank you for the kind and generous super chats um, from y'all. Let's read some. 
and then raid some. <laughs> yeah. Uh, thank you for the super chat from. Uh, uh, you've gone way too far. What What's the date? Uh, there we. Hang on. You can see the thumbnail on the right there. there Thanks for the super chat from Brian Callahan. Thanks, Brian. Who says I'm drunk and waiting for my Taco Bell delivery at 3 a.m. Listening to these food descriptions when I'm hungry is going to be like erotica. I hope it's good, man. I hope your Taco Bell um, fulfills you in every way you, you need it to. Stannis McNuff. What a name. Thank you for the five euros. Um, please, Glimbo, um, do a cockabridged and let Swift do an episode of The Bliss Take. That's an interesting idea. Do you think that anyone... I don't think anyone would enjoy that actually, though. I don't think anyone would notice the difference. <laughs> Well, welcome. Okay, I people would I notice. can't do it. <laughs> no, you gotta, you got to stop down here. What? <laughs> Shizzle. Vocal exercise. Thank you, Shizzlebricks, who says, what do you guys think Euron's final fate will be? It's a real change of tone, um, <laughs> Shizzlebricks. <laughs> I, I really like the idea that Euron is going to summon some kind of monster with the blood ritual that he's performing in the sea, with the with the priests that he's got tied to his ships and his brother that he's murdering and the pregnant woman that he's murdering, Folly of Flowers. And I think that some kind of Lovecraftian squid monster will rise from the depths because there has been a lot of talk of squid activity drawn by blood in the Sponge Winds of Winter preview Bob. chapters. And I would think it would be wonderfully poetic if Euron got eaten by the monster yeah, that like, he summons. Like the second or third thing that thing does is kill Euron. That would be hilarious. Yeah. What do you think? Oh, maybe, like, it it helps him take Old Town or whatever, and then shortly afterwards, because Euron... Like, to do the next thing Euron wants to do, they'd have to go somewhere, right? Yeah. I don't know if this Lovecraftian deity monster would be down for a train ride. Exactly. Like, what does Euron do? To like, King's Landing. You can't put a leash on Cthulhu. Like, it's just not gonna... And the next time we see it, it's just gonna randomly rear its head wherever Drogon is at that point in time. I think that the odds of a dragon versus Lovecraft squid battle are like fairly high in the Winds of Winter. Personally. Not enough people talk about this. They don't this is what they don't want you to know. Yeah. This is what George is keeping from you. Thank you, JJ Bones, who says it's four AM, I'm trying to sleep at a birthday party at which I had too many drinks and now I'm hungry. Man. Been there. Thank you. Um, Stannis McNuff again. Uh, could Butterbumps be a horse? They're known for devouring chicks and whole fruits. That's a good point. Um, it's, like, lightly implied, but I don't really like to run theories based on just, you know, the, the vibes of evidence. I like having textual, um, you know, facts that we yeah, can... Yeah, we like some proper academic yeah. backing it, towards... It, it's good that that's where your theoretical mind is going, though. However, I noticed that Butterbumps was described as having large, rubbery lips. Is he a duck? <laughs> well, he hasn't quacked yet. Thank you for the super chat from Conquer1708, who says, Would you rather fight 100 angry chickens or 100 angry rats? Fuck. No weapons. You're thrown into a room and given five minutes before battle commences. What am I going to do with that five minutes? I'm going to pray to every god I can think of. I, I know that I said before that chickens have some uh, potency in battle, but I think rats are scarier. Rats are scarier, and they have more experience in coordinated combat. Yes. Rats are faster. Rats bite, I think. Rats is... have more limbs. Yeah. That they're capable of using for things. Uh, chickens, I feel like I could just drop punt. Most of them. Yeah, I'll just, like, wave my legs around every so often. Or, like, the important thing is staying upright. A, a, a chicken can't climb you. A yeah. rat can. I mean, chickens can fly. Oh, a bit. Mm. Depends on the chicken, but chickens can fly I, I'm, I'm taking my I'm taking my chances with the chickens. Good question. Excellent question, Conker. Uh, thanks for the super chat from John T. Savage, who says, It's ironic that these streams have had the best theory discussion so far. You reckon? <laughs> Better than our theory live streams? Better than our um, the, the, <laughs> our not knowing what the chaotic lawful axis means? 
Thank you for the super chat from Smeagol. He says, would you guys do a stream ranking all the Valyrian steel swords in the series? Keep up the good work. Um, I mean, anything's on the table. Um, we've been waiting for 12 years, so... I d yeah, I don't see why not. Yeah. I think that the winner would be the um, Keltagar Valyrian Steel Axe, or the Valyrian Steel Arak. That is pretty fucking awesome. Used by Kraz. Uh, oh, oh no, this is a disturbing missive. We've received a raven from Alt Swift Rivers, who says, The enemy has overwhelmed us. Father, have mercy. Uh, well, Swift, my son, uh, use the training that I gave you. Uh, I know I said I would send reinforcements. Uh, sorry, I was busy. But uh, I believe in you. I think we need a kind of forgot button on the soundboard. I kind of forgot about the Iron Fleet, but I'm sure you'll be <laughs> fine. Look, Alt Swift Rivers, if you have so few resources that you're becoming overwhelmed, don't send them to us. Yeah. You'll be, yeah. you'll be fine. You'll I'm be right. We've got Raccoon News Network. Thank you very much. Bleed over, go Jamie. Oh, hang on. That's in reference to something Jamie was eating. Was it the horse oats? I think that's a deep cut reference. I don't understand. I'm sure it makes sense if you watched it in real time. Thank you, Penitent Stance. And thank you, Kai Alexander, who says, Wondering what you'll think about a shitpost theory that me and my friend came up with. After Joanna died, Tywin did not touch another woman as to not dishonor her memory. A man, however, that's a different story. Hang on. What's the implication about Shay then? Uh, Shay is a man, is what Kai Alexander is implying. But uh, we, we have POVs from Tyrion that make it quite abundantly clear... Uh, well, I don't know, it's all up to Shay's identity, but I, there's zero evidence. Yeah, no, what Kai is implying is that until Shay, Tywin had sex with men. Which is possible if Shatay is... Like, we know that Tywin... We know that there is a tunnel to the Shatay's um, brothel. What kind of tunnel, sorry? I would go so far <laughs> as to say a secret tunnel <laughs> through the mountain. <laughs> It kind of is through a mountain. It goes through Visenya's... No, Rainy's Hill. <laughs> I'm impressed that you remember which hill it is. I always forget which hill. Well, I looked it up for the horse video. But I'm, well, <laughs> I'm just saying that if there are male sex workers at Shatea's, and I don't know if there are, but if there are, then your shitpost theory might be true. I'm not... I don't buy it. Or maybe Tywin had sex with people, he just didn't touch them. Entirely possible. Mm. You have to scroll up a bit if we want to keep going. Thanks not catching the whole window. Thanks for the super chat from Boob Cybot, who says, Finally caught a stream during the depths of insomnia. Would you eat lamprey pie? And oh, what... That came up, didn't it? Yeah, we've covered that. I think our answer is... Well, I would try it. I'd try it. I would but... try it. I'm not excited about it, though. And what modern day food would you guys want to eat with germ? Obviously, the winds of winter. <laughs> We would I imagine would... that you show up to his ranch at Santa Fe, <laughs> and he presents you with two copies of The Winds of Winter. And it's like we're not opening these. Yeah, what if George says, "I will <laughs> give you The Winds of Winter, but only if you eat it with me." <laughs> that is like the Faustian bargain you must make to finally get wins. I would do it, George, if you're listening. Of course, George is an avid listener of yeah, these live streams. Thanks for sticking around, George. Thanks for, thanks for sticking in, George. Um, anytime, we will eat the Windsor Winter with you. Uh, and in reference to the three horse steaks that were eaten earlier, uh, Jake Hunusik says, three Tyrek steaks. Yum. Yum, yum, yum. Yum, yum, yum. Because Tyrek is a horse. He's a little palfrey. I think there were a horse at Shatea's brothel as well. That was a pun. Let's do more food descriptions. Wherever horse go. Wherever horse go. So... Oh, sorry, everyone. Jamie Lannister goes to Harrenhal after his hand has been cut off oh. and he's been a prisoner of the Brave Companions and then a prisoner in Harrenhal for a bit, I suppose. Uh, and then Roose Bolton comes and takes over Harrenhal uh, and inquires as to Jamie Lannister's diet these recent times. Uh, what have you been feeding him? And Jamie says, worms and piss and grey vomit. And the guard insists, <laughs> hard bread and water and oat porridge. 
Gladys, I, I can't disagree. The uh, worms piss and gray vomit. If only there was something lower than F. <laughs> Jamie truly has a silver tongue as well yeah. as a golden hand, doesn't mm. he? And then Kyben gives a little potion to Jamie. Licorice steeped in vinegar with honey and cloves to give him strength and clear his head. Hmm. Licorice in vinegar. That's interesting. It's, it, ta- it sounds a bit gross to me. Do we have any other mentions of licorice? No, I think we do, but I think it's like treated as quite exotic. How do you make licorice? It's aniseed. But what, what, what do you put it in? Um, like licorice candies, you mean? Yeah. Um, sugar. <laughs> ah, that's the secret ingredient. No, um, that Maybe is, like gelatin? I don't know. That is the only use of the word licorice in A Song of Ice Really? Yeah, oh, no, only... aniseed came up elsewhere. That's what I was thinking of. Hmm. hmm. Licorice steeped in vinegar. If licorice is aniseed, why don't we just call it aniseed? I think it's more than just aniseed. I, like, it's an aniseed. Like, it's the, uh, like, main flavor in it. Mm. Um, I don't think that sounds very good to me. Mm. I think any one of those things on their own would be good, but like licorice and vinegar and honey. Yeah, yeah I think George is going for like medicine here, not a delicious beverage. Well, he didn't even put any opium in this one. That's interesting, isn't it? Like pretty much every other medical potion that we come across... Like, characters constantly refer to consuming milk of the poppy to clear their heads and ease pain. Well, I don't think it clears their head. I think it dulls their mind. Right. Whereas in this case, they're trying to clear Jamie's head and sharpen him up. So a good slap to the face in the form of vinegar is what he needs. Yeah, well, maybe George realized that opium wouldn't really be the... um, You can't solve every problem with opium, George. I keep telling you. Opium dribbled down his chin. <laughs> <laughs> I think there's a C. Bang. And then uh, Jamie and Brienne have a very awkward dinner with Lord Roos Bolton. Uh, and Roos offers a spread of cheese, bread, cold meat, and fruit. It sounds like Christmas. Yum. And I think that, like, it's cold meat because Roos is a cold-blooded individual. Or maybe he's just into cold cuts. Could be both. Uh, Thinks it works better with the bread. Jamie Lannister insists on drinking red wine, not white wine. Because, <laughs> because he's a Lannister. I, re- I really like that bit. Is it Illyrio who's like, you Westerosi are so obsessed with your heraldry and your animals. You think you're lions and, 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 and bears and direwolves and it's ridiculous. He mocks the ridiculousness of, I mean, like, the heraldic identity. Point. It is ridiculous. Drinking red wine because he's a Lannister. Get stuffed, Jamie. And then Roose Bolton... Do the Starks he- drink white wine? <laughs> I don't think that's a thing. I don't think there's a single moment. I don't think Eddard <laughs> is very into white wine. Catelyn hits the champers every... That I can believe. <laughs> I guarantee that Catelyn was wine drunk when she... Uh, <laughs> Kidnapped told, told, told. Well, yes. <laughs> Um, definitely wine, wine boomer energy. And then Roos eats a prune in small, sharp bites. And he says, do try these, Sir Jamie. They are most sweet and help move the bowels as well. Spot on Roos Bolton voice right there. (laughs) If Bolton meant to kill us. He wouldn't be wasting his precious prunes on us at such peril to his bowels. <laughs> such peril to his bowels. <laughs> That's a great line. <laughs> Jamie stared at the meat and realised there was no way to cut it one-handed. <laughs> I'm worth less than a girl now. That's what I find so fun about Roos, is that he's so menacing, but also so, like, disarmingly human. Yeah. Like, like he's introduced to Arya when he's, like, lying naked, being leeched. He's in, like, this position of vulnerability, you know? And yet he's so scary. Yeah. It's such interesting characterization with Roos. Well, that's a very Georgie thing, isn't it? That um, the, the scariest of people are people. Yeah. And not cartoonish monsters. Although there is a lot of cartoonish monster to Roos Bolton. Yeah. Yeah, it can be a bit of both. Um, 
So what do you think of this 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 meal of cheese, bread, cold meat, fruit, prunes, and red wine? That sounds pretty good, really. Yeah, it, it seems like a good sort of like snacking situation. Yeah, like um, this is the the cheese board before the games night begins. They're about to play Twister. Yeah, absolutely. Roost, Jamie, and Brienne playing Twister. <laughs> I would pay... Jamie only has three things to work with. I would pay good money for that. That that sounds like something to type into like Mid Journey or Dali, <laughs> meaning like Jamie Brian and Roose Bolton playing Twister. Wow, I think that's a. What do you reckon, C or B? I was gonna say it's a B. C or B. Yeah, yeah I reckon that's B. Uh, so then Arya is with the uh, Brotherhood without banners, and they stay at a brew house beside a little river. And their hosts had a cachet of food hidden beneath the floor of the stables, and they shared a simple supper, oaten bread, onions, and a watery cabbage soup t- tasting faintly of garlic. Aya found a slice of carrot floating in her bowl and counted herself lucky. Oh, look, I've got a bit of carrot. Ah, oh, that's an uncanny Maisie Williams. You've got that close. <laughs> There's a Twitch clip of me doing a much better Maisie Williams impression. <laughs> <laughs> I just find it so charming how Arya is so positive about the little carrot that yeah. she found floating in her subpar meal. During her trip into the wastelands of the war-torn riverlands. Yeah. She's she's really trying. Yeah, keep that chin up, Arya. Is this a C-tier meal, do you reckon? Yeah. Like, there's nothing, like, aggressively bad about it. It's just quite plain. Mm. I Just watery soup isn't my... That's not how you get me. I enjoy this line. I like turnips, said Jack. <laughs> Agreed. Agreed. <laughs> <laughs> Award-winning author George R. R. Martin. That is a good sentence. Um, so uh, we're, we've, we're with Bran again, and we're at the Queen's Crown Tower, just shy of the wall. Um, I imagine Mira's just gone on a hunt, and here she is dividing the duck between the four of them. She'd caught it in her net the day before. Ah, I preempted the... There we go. As it tried to rise from the marsh where she'd surprised it. It wasn't as tasty cold as it had been hot and crisp from the spit, but at least they did not go hungry. Bran and Mira shared the breast while Jojen <laughs> ate the thigh. Hodor devoured the wing and leg, muttering Hodor, and licking the grease off his fingers after every bite. Hodor, you wait until you're done and then lick the grease off. It's much more considerate to those among you with misophonia. But then he won't get to lick his fingers as many times. Yeah, That's true. Really and that he... is a lot of fun, Hodor. Hodor is having a great time, and yeah. I love that for him. I think this sounds yum. It's, it's just a roast duck. It's a roast duck. But yeah, it is a day-old roast duck, so... Oh, come on. It's not like pizza. It doesn't taste better the next morning. I disagree with that common wisdom. I think pizza tastes best the night you have it. And so does duck. Well, so it is like pizza then. (laughs) (laughs) I think it's a C. Okay. Uh, So then Sam and Gilly are fleeing through the haunted forest after the mutiny at Craster's Keep. Um, and Sam is imagining food to try and comfort himself and Gilly. That's how you deal with the dark times, Sam. You'll have food and drink, too. Hot mulled wine and a bowl of venison stewed with onions and Hobbs bread right out of the oven. So hot it will burn your fingers. Well, maybe wait a moment before you try to eat it, then. Sam, yeah, he's a masochist eating that hot bread. <laughs> um, I mean, Sounds th- good. It's just a hot hob meal. Yeah, I think that's... Honestly, I think that might be an A. Venison stewed with yeah. onions. Yeah. And, and the hot like mulled fresh wine. Fresh bread. Yeah. I, I think just Sam's passion here is part of what does it yeah, for good me. good on you. But then when they get to... um, where, Oh, this is like when they're picking out what food they have left. Um, Nothing was left but a few black sausages, as hard as wood. Not rocks, as Dirk had previously <laughs> described Crest as... Long black well, this is, sausage. This is a superior cut of sausage. Yeah. Sam sausage is superior. Uh, you heard it here superior first. Superior Samwell sausage times. Yep. Sam sawed off a few thin slices for each of them. The effort made his wrist ache, but he was hungry enough to persist. If you chewed the slices long enough, they softened up and tasted good. Craster's wives seasoned them with garlic. I love this so much about George's character that, like, even while they're being, like, hunted through the forest by 
zombies and mutineers. I have to stop to carve the sausage. Oh, I have to slice up my sausage. <laughs> and he's going to go into all this effort of describing the process of cutting the sausages. Now, don't swallow so quickly, because if you chew them long enough, they actually work. It does sound... Gilly, I know we're running for our lives, but I want you to savour every bite. <laughs> What's the point of being alive if you're not going to enjoy these black sausages mm. as hard as wood? That's a... E, isn't it? Like, that's just not... That's just not, not fun good. at all. That's just not good. Can we stop with the black sausages? Yeah, George is on a real black sausage stint hard, at the moment. Wood hard. Like, you smack him against the table and nothing happens. Maybe he could use them in combat. These... That's what happened when he, when he stuck the, the um, dragon glass dagger into the White Walker. It was actually a sausage. That would be a fantastic comedy bit. It turns out that, that <laughs> black sausages infused with garlic, garlic known for its anti-vampire, anti-undead ah. properties, is an effective weapon against the undead and alongside obsidian. if you chew obsidian. them long enough, they soften up and taste good. Yeah, it's a multi-purpose tool. <laughs> it doesn't work with dragon glass there. That just tastes like blood. Yeah, can't eat obsidian. Yeah. Um, now we're in Arya 9, She's tra- uh, the Hound has kidnapped her and they're on the road. Um, they ate a cold supper of hard bread, mouldy cheese, and smoked sausage. Mmm. Mmm. I like the sound of the smoked sausage. Yeah. It kind of, like, I hope you eat that last to get the taste of the mouldy cheese out. And isn't the, isn't cheese basically mould yes. anyway? Well, yeah, it's particularly cultivated. So you might as well just say cheesy cheese. Or moldy well, that mold. makes it sound great. That makes it sound terrible. <laughs> uh, I, I think that's a D. It could even be a C. It depends on how moldy the moldy cheese is. Can you scrape? Although, look, if if you say that it's moldy cheese, that like that's making a statement. Can you scrape the mold off the cheese? Like, are they scraping the mold off the cheese before they eat the cheese? Well, I'm. Well, so fungus makes networks all through the. Uh, cheese taxonomical expert gliders once well again. It, this isn't it's more about just how yeah how fungus works <laughs> but like if you're just scraping off the visible parts of the fungus like that's not it well that's no fun yeah guess <laughs> all right uh uh stream's over <laughs> uh i think uh, are we saying d you can say d i'm i'm fine with that all right uh, so then, uh, Catelyn and Rob Stark arrive at the Twins, and everything's gonna go great at the Twins. Storm of sausage. Catelyn says, Rob, listen to me. Once you have eaten of his bread and salt, you have guessed right, and the laws of hospitality protect you beneath his roof. And everyone knows you can't break the law. No one ever breaks laws, otherwise they'd have a law against it. Yeah. I have an army to protect me, mother. I don't need to trust in bread and salt. But if it pleases Lord Walder to serve me stewed crow smothered in maggots, I'll eat and, and ask for a second bowl. Stewed crow. Stewed crow smothered in maggots. I think it's an F. I don't want it. My god. Uh, and then we have a, a wedding feast at the Red Wedding before everything goes bad. And the wedding feast began with a thin leek soup followed by a salad of green beans, onions, and beets, river pike Ooh. poached in almond milk, Ooh. mounds of mashed turnips Ooh. that were cold before they reached the table, uh. jellied calves' brains, okay. and a leech of stringy beef. It was poor fare to set before a king, and the calves' brains turned Catelyn's stomach. I imagine. Right, that's very interesting, isn't it? It's sort of... um preludes what happens at the wedding like a- as Catelyn says this isn't what you should be doing to like at a wedding with a king and there's something violent about those jellied mm. calves brains the, that turn Catelyn's stomach and the turnips that are cold before they get there mm. now mashed turnips that sounds like you know it's not entirely uh, distant to mashed potatoes so it's, you it's, know that could be good but mm. they're cold by the time they get there Cold mashed potato is not as fun. Nowhere near. I mean, the the river pike poached in almond milk sounds, sounds pretty cool. Yeah. I don't think I've ever had fish in milk, but I mean, I'd, I'd try yeah, it. Give it a go. Yeah. I um, like how the turnips are described as being served in mounds. Mm. There's a very, like, uh, grounded, 
visceral term to describe the, the quantities of which you are serving mashed turnips. Like the mounds of northern corpses. That That's are about right. To be it's made. a reference to the to the barrows actually where the northern kings are buried. <laughs> Deep cut. <laughs> I would not have spotted that incredible writing by George Martin if you hadn't pointed that out. And what, the, what what is that word lech l e c h e a lech of stringing beef a leech of stringy beef welcome back to gliders google's the words that george uses welcome to the dictionary corner <laughs> in which we oh man i love susie dent she's so good look up words it's a milk product what, what? really hang on oh my god is it it's oh it's just spanish for milk <laughs> Lech is Spanish for milk. Well, why does Spanish exist in Westeros? And, and why? How, how do you have a milk of stringy beef? I think George might have um, done a, done a little on, typo. Let's find out. Maybe Chat knows. I mean, I mean that is a common like culinary thing. That that like kind of just using a French or Spanish or whatever word of X kind of meat, isn't it? All I'm saying is, yeah, no, this term only happens in this passage of this book. Really? Le- leech of stringy beef. I've never seen it anywhere else. So George it, is it... really flexing here. <laughs> George is really, ooh, I'm getting fancy today. I think it's leche, actually, if it's Spanish. I bet I bet George and... like saw this on a menu and was like, ooh. I'll put that in the chapter where everyone fucking dies. <laughs> <laughs> And this is the chapter that George, like, put off writing for years. Yeah, because, because he didn't so want to traumatic. think about the jellied calf's brains. Oh, my. Yeah, that was the only... That was the most <laughs> traumatic part of this chapter. The mashed turnips have gone cold. And he, like, <laughs> turns to Paris and weeps. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's so true. Um, the funny thing is that this poor fare is still better than most of the food descriptions. That is funny, yes. Like, that our year has gone through and stuff. What do you think? Where are we placing this? I don't want to eat jellied calves' brains. Not even interested in trying? Uh, I guess I would try it, but I suspect I wouldn't enjoy it. Mm-hmm. The rest? Eh. And there's a lot of milk. There's yeah. a lot of meat in milk. Lots the of... fish is in milk. The beef is in milk. Wait, what, what is this? Uh, um, who, are, who are those folks in It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia who drink all the milk? Dude, Charlie and... Um, and um... Frank. No, no, the uh, old, old, the, the weirdo family, the incestuous. <laughs> they drink milk all the time, and the guy from Westworld. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, some, yeah, the people. It was the so weird because I hadn't watched Sunny yet, and then after watching Westworld, I gave it a shot. I'm like, hang on a moment, <laughs> what, what's Will doing here? <laughs> right. <laughs> He's in a new theme park called Philadelphia World, <laughs> <laughs> and it's fucking terrible. It's worse than Westworld. I, I feel like this is a. D. I would. I could push it to a C if I just ignored the calf brains. Yeah, I mean, I agree. Like, 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 strictly, like, objectively on paper, it's like it's perfectly decent food. But like, I don't like it. I don't like it. Do it. Go C. Come on, be a big boy. It's C. And then after this unpleasant meal, the violence begins. The phrase attack the Northmen. Rob Stark gets killed, um, and amidst the melee, we have the the small John, John Umber. He bludgeons Sir Raymond Frey across the face with a leg of mutton. A tier. <laughs> Delicious. I, ho- I hope that Raymond managed to like yump a, a bit of the <laughs> mutton off while he was getting hit by it. I want to die with some mutton in my mouth. For certain. So then, uh, the Night's Watch is preparing for the Wildlings to attack Castle Black in force, uh, and we have a bit of food discussion before the battle begins. Owen the Ove popped out of the trap door, red-faced from the climb. He had a basket of buns under one arm, a wheel of cheese under the other, a bag of onions dangling from one hand. Ob said to feed you, in case you're stuck up here for a while. Um, hang on, so, oh, so he's got the basket of buns, like, stuffed under his armpit and the wheel of... Because he's got to climb the ladder somehow, right? That is an excellent point. How the hell is he climbing with all that stuff at his arms? That's incredible, really. Why didn't he put the bag of onions in the basket? 
Well, they don't call him Owen the Oaf for nothing, Gladys. <laughs> <laughs> that, um, um, that or for our last meal Thank him for us, Owen I imagine he then went and did that mm. um, Dick Follard was deaf as a stone But his nose worked well enough The buns were still warm from the oven When he went digging in the basket and plucked one out He found a crock of butter as well And spread some with his dagger Raisins, he happily announced. Nuts, too. Oh, his speech was thick. (laughs) (laughs) But easy enough to understand once you got used to it. You can have mine, too, said Saturn. I'm not hungry. Eat, John told him. There's no knowing when you'll have another chance. He took two buns himself. The nuts were pine nuts, and besides the raisins, there were bits of dried apple. Hmm. Then Owen the Oaf returned with a loaf of black bread and a pail of Hobbs' best mutton, cooked in a thick broth of ale and onions. Even Dick woke up for that. They (coughs) ate every bit of it, using chunks of bread to wipe the bottom of the pail. I'm not entirely confident about the food safety hygiene standards at Castle Black. Oh, look, they're kind of in a circumstance here, aren't they? Well, look, you don't want to be shitting yourself from food poisoning while you're trying to fight off the Magnar of Then, do you now? Well, at least you have a good excuse for shitting yourself. <laughs> Fair. I'm um, not terrified, I just had really shit. <laughs> blame Three Finger Hob. Honestly, these streams are making me appreciate Hob so much more. Right? Yeah. I... He's one of my favourite characters now. <laughs> I, I think I, I said as well, like in the previous stream that the game of thrones tv show only ever showed the night's watch people eating like Mm. some lame gruel that looks really unpleasant but there's actually a lot of good like yeah it actually sounds like one of the best places you could be like if i'm a commoner yeah and like i've stolen a loaf of bread and it's yeah and i've been sent to the wall i'm like oh i just get bread now yeah. And it's good. It's fresh. Yeah. And it's served with raisins and bits of apple and, and meat sometimes. It kind of makes sense that some common people would voluntarily join the Night's Watch. Absolutely. Especially um, when the other option is losing a limb or being killed. Yeah. So what do we got here? There's, there's a basket of buns. There's a wheel of cheese, a bag of onions. There's some uh, butter. There's some raisins and nuts. Uh, bits of apple. Mutton. Pine nuts, dried apple, ale and onions, a thick broth of ale and onions, chunks of bread. I mean, this sounds great. It's either A or S. Oh, is it an S? I think it's an A. Like, it's, yeah. it's, it hasn't quite got that, you know, je ne sais quoi. It hasn't quite got that pizzazz. I knew someone called Jenny Saquo. Oh, really? No. Your maths teacher? No. Uh, so then, Bran and Jojen and Amira and Hodor are at the Night Fort. This is the spooky Halloween castle. <laughs> this is where the Night's Watch hold their Halloween <laughs> parties. <laughs> it is, because like it's just like this fun haunted house where they're like, ooh, let's tell some ghost stories. And that's, this is where all the spooky simian star eyes. And every year they go there for Halloween. Absolutely. And Alice of Thorn sneaks on her head so that he can pop out behind a corner and scare the recruits he doesn't like. I guarantee Jarman <laughs> Buckwell has been getting wasted at the Night's Watch Halloween Night Fort party every year since he's been there. Oh man. Even the even the Lord Commander gets loose. <laughs> and you know you know what you know what Jaws Raven screams all, all night at Halloween? What's that then? Boo! <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's all charming stuff. But, like, he's sitting on on Mormont's shoulder the whole time. He's not even popping out and scaring him. Well, on. the raven has a little bedsheet ghost costume. Oh, my God. And he, like... <laughs> <laughs> he pulls up the little face and he... Goes, oh, there's, like, Bow! a little hole for his beak. <laughs> Bow! That was where the rat cook right. chopped Cannibalism. the prince into pieces he knew. And he baked the pie in one of these ovens. The rat cook had cooked the son of the Andal King in a big pie with onions, Ooh. carrots, mushrooms, lots of pepper and salt, a rasher of bacon, and a dark red Dornish wine. Then he served him to his father, who tasted, praised the taste and had a second slice. Afterward, the gods transformed the cook into a monstrous white rat who could only eat his own young. 
He had roamed the night fort ever since, devouring his children, but still his hunger was not sated. It is not for murder that the gods cursed him, old Nan said, nor for serving the Andal king, his son, in a pie. A man has a right to vengeance, but he slew a guest beneath his roof, and for that the gods cannot forgive. I don't want it. So this story about uh, cannibalizing your guests mm -hmm. and murdering your guests, do you think that might have anything to do with the Red Wedding that happened a few chapters no, ago? No, George was just thinking about lunch. He just he just wanted to eat a child. Yeah. And, and do you think that might have anything to do with Wyman Manderley serving the phrase their own kin no. in Winterfell in Book 5? Again, lunch. I don't think there's any consequences coming to any of those characters. No. For their murder and cannibalism. Nah. In fact, Wyman Mandley's really cool for doing that. I think Wyman Mandley's just such a great guy who everyone should admire yeah. and and aspire to be like. Would you like to eat a, all of that? Um, well, honestly, everything else sounds pretty good. If you just subtract... Like, if I was at a restaurant, I would say, could I please have the big pie with onions, carrots, mushrooms and everything... But but I'm but just sub out the Andal oh, child. Oh, so sorry, sir. We do not make alterations to the menu. Well, I have an allergy, sir. So <laughs> I'm somewhere really. Else. Uh, c can I eat around no. the? No. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, no F because that's human flesh. <laughs> I think it's really interesting though that old Nan makes a point that um, it's fine to kill a guy. It's fine to feed him his son. Um. But it's not okay to do it um, when you've told him you won't. Yeah, well, my grandmother taught all of her grandchildren that murder's cool as long as you look up. Yeah, guests. only if you do it out on the streets. Uh, <laughs> so then in Meereen, we are introduced to these characters called Austin Whitebeard and Strong Belwas. Who, who could these fun characters possibly be? I bet it's Bronn. I bet it's Gimli, son of Gloin. Uh, and so Strong Belwas is a kooky character, and he says, Find liver and onions, Whitebeard. Not for now, for after. Killing makes Strong Belwas hungry. And that's Belwas' gimmick. He loves liver and onions. That's his thing. That's what's, it's just what he does. Doesn't specify what kind of liver. Doesn't matter. Doesn't even say how cooked it is. Just liver. He eats raw liver. That's a hard C for me. Bang. What's next? Inside Marine, the slavers would soon be reclining in their fringed tokars to feast on lamb and olives, unborn puppies, Ugh. honeyed dormice, and Ugh. other such delicacies, whilst outside her children went hungry. Unborn puppies? Ugh. They don't lay eggs, George. Yeah, that's there's a <laughs> lot that I don't like about that. God. Wait, so unborn puppies, that... The Ugh. implication Ugh. is that they've been Ugh. harvested. Or that it's been cooked inside the pregnant dog. But we just don't eat the rest of that dog. We're only eating the unborn puppies. I, after mentioning It's Always Sunny, I keep imagining Rickety Cricket and his various misadventures with oh, dogs that are described. Poor Cricket. I could imagine this to be the sort of thing that Rickety Cricket would eat. H honey dormice actually sound I could work Yeah, like I'd give that a go I mean, Lamb and olives like Lamb and sure, olives whatever. is fine yeah. yeah, honestly every part of this apart from the unborn puppies sounds great <laughs> <laughs> Just, I'll, I'll, I'll eat, I'll eat around uh, the unborn puppies hell. I don't think it's an F, I think it's an E Good lord <laughs> <laughs> I like how this is praised as like, oh man, they get to eat the unborn puppies. I think it's interesting how like Daenerys does not show disgust for this weird food because like it's not weird to her. No. Because she's grown up in Essos and in many different cultures in Essos. Yeah. And she has often not gotten to choose what kind of food that she wants. She sometimes has had no food. So I guess it makes sense that, you know, she's kind of open-minded. She basically ate nothing but horse for a solid year. Yeah, including the heart. Oh, um. by the way, a horse's heart weighs like seven pounds or something like that. 
what, what's that in metricals? Ah, uh, I think I saw somewhere that about thing. a horse heart. <laughs> yeah, it's one horse heart, which is a metric unit <laughs> of weight. We'll call up the international standards people. I actually think I saw somewhere four kilos, which is not seven pounds. Those are different things. Um, do, you, well, do you really think Daenerys was expected to eat the entire horse heart? Yeah. What do you think? Maybe it was a pony heart. No. Nah. Just a, <laughs> you checked. <laughs> far laps heart. Oh my goodness! <laughs> I guess someone could still eat far laps heart, heart couldn't they? Uh, I, th- I think he's been mummified. I don't think his organs are still on display in the in the museum. Well, where have they put the organs? Oh, that's a good point. Well, maybe someone ate them. We're talking about a famous racehorse for those who aren't up to date on their far lap law. Uh, so then, uh, Sansa and Tyrion, I think, have breakfast before the wedding of King Joffrey and Marjorie Tyrell. <clears throat> In the Queen's ballroom, they broke their fast on honey cakes baked with blackberries and nuts, gammon steaks, bacon, finger fish, crisped in breadcrumbs. Those are just fish fingers! <laughs> Autumn pears, and a Dornish dish of onions, cheese, and chopped eggs cooked up with fiery peppers. Nothing like a hearty breakfast to whet one's appetite for the 77 course feast to follow, Tyrion commented as their plates were filled. There were flagons of milk and flagons of mead and flagons of a slight sweet golden wine to wash it down. This is S tier. This is S tier. This sounds amazing. Fish fingies, let's go. The honey cakes baked with blackberries and nuts. Mm. The autumn pears. The Dornish dish of onions. Yeah, the fiery peppers. That's great. Yeah. Yeah, smang it. I love it. I'm not feeling great for the wedding, though. Yeah, uh, who's, whose voice is oh, ready for this? <laughs> this is, I think we may have to trade it. This is the biggest uh, food description in the book. This is the royal wedding. The first dish was a creamy soup of mushrooms and buttered snails served in gilded bowls. We're off to an incredible start. One done, 76 to come. 77 dishes. While there are still starving children in this city, and men who would kill for a radish, they might not love the Tyrells half so well if they could see us now. The second course was being served. A pastry coffin filled with pork, pine nuts, and eggs. Tyrion listened with half a ear, as he sampled sweet corn fritters and hot oat bread baked with bits of date, apple and orange, and gnawed on the rib of a wild boar. The wedding guests ate trout cooked in a crust of crushed almonds. The lords and ladies sampled roast herons and cheese and onion pies. Crabs boiled in fiery eastern spices. Trenches filled with chunks of chopped mutton stewed in almond milk with carrots, raisins, and onions, and fish tarts fresh from the ovens, served so hot they burned the fingers. Tyrion suffered through it with a double helping of honey ginger partridge and several cups of wine. Peacocks were served in their plumage, roasted whole and stuffed with dates. The serving men ladled out bowls of blandisserie, a mixture of brief broth and boiled wine sweetened with honey and dotted with blanched almonds and chunks of capon. Then came the strolling pipers and clever dogs and sword swallowers with buttered peas, chopped nuts and slivers of swan poached in a sauce of saffron and peaches. A juggler kept a half-dozen swords and axes swirling through the air as skewers of blood sausage were brought sizzling to the tables, a juxtaposition that Tyrion thought passing clever, though not perhaps in the best of taste. Roundels of elk stuffed with ripe blue cheese were being brought out when one of Lord Rowan's knights stabbed a Dornishman. The gold cloaks dragged them both away. The great pie made its slow way down the length of the hall, wheeled along by a half-dozen beaming cooks. Two yards across it was, crusty and golden brown, and they could hear squeaks and thumpings coming from inside it. Joffrey and Marjorie joined hands to lift the greatsword and swung it down together in a silvery arc. When the pie crust broke, the doves burst forth in a swirl of white feathers, scattering in every direction, flapping for the windows and the rafters. 
A serving man placed a slice of hot pigeon pie in front of Tyrion and covered it with a spoon of lemon cream. The pigeons were well and truly cooked in this pie, but he found them no more appetizing than the white ones fluttering about the hall. Sansa was not eating either. My god. <clears throat> that is a lot of food. I'm stuffed. Do we want to go to the dictionary corner and find out what blandisserie is? Well, is it a mixture of beef beef broth and boiled wine sweetened with honey and dotted with blanched almonds and mixes, or is that a different thing? Well, yeah, no, maybe you're right. I think you probably are right. Um, I feel like George just could have said they brought up bowls of beef broth and boiled wine sweetened Instead with honey. But inventing right. a word. Yeah, right. Because that appears to have been what he's done. <laughs> really? No yeah. search results? Um, Surely not. Blandisserie. I mean, my fir- the first results are all this passage. Really? But this website appears to think that it's... Yeah, it's a thing. Weird. Has George taken some, like, medieval food oh, term and just, like, brought it back? That's absolutely amazing. he has. I mean, certainly there's a lot of amazing food here. This, the, the soup of mushrooms and snails. The pastry with pork and pine nuts and eggs. The oat bread with date, apple, orange, the trout, the herons. I'm interested in roast heron. The cheese and onion pies. I think this is an S. It's got to be an S. And the reason I think it's an S is Mm. that even if some of this doesn't sound appetizing to you, there is enough food here, enough different sorts of food that you can still have, you can not eat most of this and still have the best meal of your life. Absolutely. Absolutely. There's something here for everyone. Except Sansa. <laughs> I'm not I'm not so sure about the um pie with all of the pigeons roasted inside it alive. Like there's gotta be a certain amount of pigeon poop inside that pie. Hmm. That doesn't sound great to me. But uh yeah. Guano. So then Tyrion uh, gets accused of murdering his Oh, we, pro- we should probably touch on that part of this feast. The poison. Well, that's true, because there is some wine that is drunk and there is some pie that is eaten by Joffrey mm. and then he chokes and dies he does die he dies until he's dead I wonder what special ingredient might have been in that wine or in that pie that caused him to die what a guy what a rhyme anyway you take over <laughs> <laughs> have you seen Bruiser? no it's um, it's a uh, pre-peep show it's Mitchell and Webb ah. um, and there's this skit where this guy walks into a shop and says do you do poison? <laughs> and um and, and the joke is that it's never a poison shop. He, like, walks into a bakery, <laughs> and one time he does it at a library. And that's just what I imagine, um, presumably Littlefinger mm. uh, doing. I mean, so, later at the trial, Pycelle testifies that um, the tears of Lisa missing from his, uh, you know, poison stores. Which is a completely normal and it's reasonable a, thing for a mesa to have and no one should ever question the why it's okay. detectable poison that I have around went missing. Yes, as a healer and advisor to the king, of I course I need yes. deadly poison. <laughs> completely normal thing. Why? Don't question it. And Maester Pycelle, why do you have so, so many stores of deadly poison in your uh, apothecary? Mm. Oh, uh, Deadly poison. <laughs> and no lock on the poison store as well, right? Oh, there's evil... How could I have possibly stopped someone from stealing deadly undetectable poison from my unlocked cupboard that anyone could walk in and take? I hereby accuse you. <laughs> um, but baking live birds, it's all bone and, like, eyeballs and, as you say, poop. Yeah, that sounds terrible. I imagine that if you were smart, you would have like a multi-chambered pie. There would be the chamber with the live pigeons. And when you cut the pie, they fly out of the top part Uh that has the live pigeons. And then underneath that, you would have pigeons that you actually like plucked and prepared and killed beforehand. So it's a pigeon pie and you just don't eat the top part that has all the poop in it. I like um, when this scene is portrayed in HBO's Game of Thrones. What's that? There's a TV show based on these books. Is that right? Yeah. H- the, the, what, from the Home Box Office channel? Home Gen? Box Office. Oh my, they're going places. <laughs> um, when Joffrey cuts into the pie, um, he's ma- like, there are just some dead pigeons. Just some freshly dead pigeons <laughs> lying on the pie crust. 
Ew. And he's like, yeah, look at me. Ain't I a stinker? And then he dies. Ew. Um, some people in the live chat are asking if the poison tastes good. Um, maybe. It, well, I mean, he drank all the wine down, didn't he? Yeah, I mean, it didn't he stop ate, Joffrey from drinking he it. He also ate all of Tyrion's pie. Or maybe he only ate a bit of it. Hmm. Which order does it happen in? Does he eat the pie and then drink the wine? Yeah, that's right. He drinks the wine to wash the pie down. Mm. And then he immediately starts choking. So, like, most people assume that, you know, the poison was meant for Joffrey and um, it was in his cup of wine, even though he was sharing it with Marjorie. Um, and other people think that it was in Tyrion's pie cream because, like, it's pointed out here that a serving man covered Tyrion's pie particularly with a spoon of lemon cream. Mm. I don't know about a pigeon pie with lemon cream. Yeah, that's mixing that's the savory with strange. the sweet. What's going on there? I mean, you, you can, like, do that in certain situations. But should you? <laughs> they never stop to ask if they should mm. put lemon cream on pigeon pie. And, yeah, so people think that Tyrion was in, indeed the intended target of this poisoning. And we're not going to crack that nut today. Yeah, I've Just I've bring it up. I've never done a deep dive on the poisoning of of Joffrey and like I mean yeah like I think it's a fun little topic yeah because there's still some ambiguity in there yeah but then in in HBO's television program um, a game of these thrones mm. Um, mm. it's made explicit that um, Olena partnered up with. Little finger. Elena's motive is well. He seems mean. Well, jo Sansa told us he's mean, and Tommen seems nicer. And Peter's motive was um, for shits and gigs. It would it would turn out. Yeah, he had an opening that Friday night, so <laughs> like, it was like, uh, let's you know do yeah. some regicide. <laughs> a spot of regicide. But but it is it is clear in both the book and the show that Elena takes the amethyst from Sansa's hairnet. Yeah. And that uh, well, is the vector of the poison. The passage in the book is that she fussed with her hair. And then Sansa later comes to the conclusion, because she notices that an amethyst is missing from yeah. her hairnet later. So it's pretty clear that that's the vector of the poison. And Elena is the one who takes it. Like, unless we try and argue that it's just a well, coincidence I, I, that... I can't remember the um, bit with the missing amethyst. You're probably right. Yeah, no, th there is an amethyst thing going on. Yep. But, I mean, I wouldn't put it past Peter to, like, lie. Oh, Peter definitely you know? wants Tyrion dead, I think. Yeah. Um, And like, he, he's been shown before to improvise, oh, yeah, I did that around a chaotic situation to take advantage of it. So, yeah. I don't know. Yeah, and and there's no point where Elena says, "Hey, I met at the king." Yeah, because it was why me. the fuck would she say that? There's a scene in Game of Thrones where she meets up with Marjorie and's like, oh, "I did it," and it's like, "What? Why? Why would you say that?" Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and and I think that George, like like there are lots of uh, parts, especially in like Fire and Blood and House of the Dragon, when George plays with this idea of like history being wrong and like historical ambiguity, and you know, they're not being total i didn't proof notice that in fire and, and evidence well it's yeah i it's mean it's a pretty subtle theme i guess if only someone would make some youtube videos some bliss takes if you will oh silence um what watch gladys's videos um sure don't. and i think george might like leaving some ambiguity as to what exactly happened here mm. i i agree i'm pretty sure we won't have a scene where elena and peter meet up and say wasn't it fun that time we conspired to Kill Joffrey. There were moments in like season seven and eight of God when that they were they scanned exactly like that. Characters <laughs> were like straight up eyeballing the camera and saying, "Recall in season two of the Game of the Thrones when I, Lady Elena." <laughs> yeah, that was mm. uh, it. Was not great. And then Tyrion is thrown in jail for supposedly poisoning King Joffrey. Uh, this is not live, um, Zeme in the live chat. Sorry, I just wanted to um, address that question really quick. <laughs> yes, okay. We're, we're taking a question from Sorry. our live studio audience to confirm that this is indeed pre-recorded. And no, Amberly, we can't see your live yeah, no, question, nor no. can we see yours, Patrick. Um, so Tyrion's in jail. And uh, as we noticed before, sometimes highborn people get good food in jail. Uh, better food than the starving people of King's Landing are getting. 
because Tyrion gets porridge and apples to break his fast with a horn of ale. Tyrion had broken his fast on boiled eggs, burned bacon, and fried bread, and dressed in his finest. <laughs> but then the thought that he's going to be uh, thought responsible for the murder of Joffrey makes him so bloody angry that he flung the bowl and spoon across the room and left a smear of a porridge minute. on the wall. <laughs> Wait a minute. So, this reminds me of Sweet Robin throwing yeah. the porridge across the room. Yeah. <laughs> is that what George is trying to invoke when in that passage? <laughs> the two times in this series that someone throws a bowl of porridge is Tyrion and Sweet Robin. That's fantastic. Same level of... Uh, Cognitive. <laughs> emotional maturity. Uh, they both have tantrums. Yeah, absolutely. And they're both, like, strangely aware. Do you notice that in Sweet Robin? That he's, like, like he knows things. Yeah. It, it's a bit brand like in that way, I think. Marillion, he keeps singing. Yeah. No, sir, I, want, I can't save. Um, I like how the, co- the prison cooks have... Um, n- you know, we're keeping Tyrion comfortable. We're cooking the bacon the way he likes. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. Bacon burned black. Bit of food preference continuity yeah. from George Martin there. This book was written four years later. Because, like... sure, George might get, uh, say, the the sex of some horses or incorrect. the colour of a king's George eyes. might get some of his king's eyes colour wrong, like Renly. George might get the hips wrong on Jane Westerling. But if there's one thing George gets right, he knows exactly what kind of bacon each character likes. I mean, the thing is, I remembered that, so... <laughs> I am, yeah. Um, is, I think this is, like... Is this A tier food? It might be. Honestly, and he just throws it at the wall. Porridge, apples, ale, boiled eggs, burnt bacon, fried bread. It's a very hearty breakfast. I I think it could be an A. Yeah, I I quite like that. A. A. What's next? Well, um, we've arrived in the fingers. San- um, Littlefinger has whisked Sansa away. Whisked? <laughs> <laughs> winkled. Winkle. These are both food terms. Whisked and winkled. Oh, oh yeah. yeah. Um, we've been told by the way that a winkle is a mollusk. It's like a no, it's not a mollusk. It's a bivalve. I think it's like an oyster or a clam. Does a mollusk only have one valve? Um, or is it a trivalve? I actually don't know. <laughs> Fuck. <laughs> we'll do some valve accounting on our next live stream. <laughs> valve review. Valve um, review. Uh, righto. So this is Peter having his first meal off the ship, I guess. Ah cold salt mutton i must be home when i break my fast on gulls eggs and seaweed soup i'll be certain of it um gristle reappeared before he could say more balancing a large platter she settled down between them gristle is a name that's incredible george really was um (laughs) thinking of lunch today you might pronounce it grizzel but i like Gristle. gristle Um, There were apples and pears and pomegranates, some sad-looking grapes. Aww. (laughs) (laughs) What makes a grape look sad? (laughs) Um, A huge blood orange. The old woman had brought a round of bread as well and a crock of butter. Peter cut a pomegranate in two with his dagger, offering half to Sansa. You should try and eat, my lady. Thank you, my lord. Pomegranate seeds were so messy, Sansa chose a pear instead and took a small, delicate bite. It was very ripe. The the juice ran down her chin. Peter loosened a seed with the point of his dagger. There's a clever girl. He smiled, his thin lips bright red from the pomegranate seeds. Well, you've written here about Greek myth. You want to make a little observation about Greek mythology, do you? You know, a little Song of Ice and Fire food stream. Look, I think it's essential that the only way we can understand the food and its deliciousness is the is the is the pomegranate things. Like in like I I guess like he could have chosen to make this any fruit. He does it, I think, more than once with the Mm. pomegranate seeds and Peter, because it's the story of of Hades abducted Persephone into the underworld, like Littlefinger abducted Sansa. And by eating the pomegranate seeds, that, like, trapped Persephone in the underworld. And then there was a change in seasons as a result. Because, like, Demeter, the goddess of the seasons or whatever, and it made an eternal winter, if I'm recalling correctly. So, like, that connects to the Song of Ice and Fire and the winter and the White Walkers. So I think that's definitely deliberate. So do you think that Peter trying to feed Sansa pomegranates would make 
the coming winter truly eternal? I think it's a symbol, Gliders. Oh, okay. It's like the blue curtains. <laughs> We're doing lit review. I'm doing a bit of media analysis. Yes, yes. Oh, and then and then he marries Lysa. That's such an uncomfortable passage. <laughs> and then trestle tables were set up beneath the small flint tower, and they feasted on quail, venison, and roast boar, washing it down with a fine light mead. Grizel, Grizzle, climbed up to the bedchamber to serve the lord and lady a tray of morning bread with butter, honey, fruit, and cream. He kissed his lady wife and licked a smear uh. of honey off her lips. Uh. Lysa set the comb down and licked honey off her fingers. Uh, how are you doing anything with honey on your fingers? There's... How do you go about... Like, yeah. if there's honey on my fingers, that's well... priority number one. That's a level one emergency. Well, well, the comb is a honeycomb, not a hair comb, just to clarify. <laughs> I mean, you could use it as both. Is she brushing her hair with a honeycomb? <laughs> Honestly, I would not put it past Lysa Aaron to brush her hair with a honeycomb. You maybe could make that work. If you, like, cut the comb... And, like, the hexagonal structure, you, like... And then it would create some sort of, like, like teeth to it on the honeycomb. The issue with honey is that it's, like, primary component is sucrose, which is very sticky. How do you know it's sucrose, specifically? I think it's sucrose. Why wouldn't it be? <laughs> My God. Um, oh, like... why wouldn't it be? Because honey, bees. Bzz. Lord bees, Brie. When... <laughs> would you like to rate some of this food? Um, I mean, it sounds pretty good. I don't know what's making the grapes sad. Well, yeah, well, yeah, it's funny because like L Littlefinger is saying that the food sucks here, but then this food looks pretty good. Yeah, I mean, gulls' eggs, I imagine, aren't very different to any other eggs. I I think that all of this food would be great if it weren't for the context of <laughs> Littlefinger and Lysa just yeah. getting sticky and the juice running and the it's it's it they're sticky gross individuals that I don't want them to touch me with their sticky fingers yeah there's too much and of course the context like wait a minute wait a minute hang on there's a song about um like the perfect maiden in in Westeros in the song of ice and fire um the the blonde maiden of summer with honey in her hair with honey she's been her combing hair. her hair with a honeycomb oh a new theory this must be a practice <laughs> dating back to the first man of combing honey into your hair as like a as like a harvest fertility spring ritual <laughs> sorry for interrupting you I just thought that that was more important <laughs> You're not wrong. Um, no, this is good. A? I think B because it's too sticky. Oh, okay. The the context makes it worse. Sticky context. Okay. What's Ew. next? Um, where are we? Oh, John. Uh, what's about to happen? So, so the battle is about to happen. Or oh, I think okay. some of the battle has happened. Yeah, and more yeah. battle is about to happen. That's right. Because um, the, the battle is happening, and then we leave. And watch some other stuff happen, and then we go back to the battle. It's crazy how long this battle takes in the book, actually. Um, besides, this might be my last meal. It might be my last meal for all of us. So it was that. So it was that John had a belly full of bread, bacon, onions, and cheese when he heard horse shout, "It's coming!" How many horse? Do you, yeah. Who, who was this horse? Was John a horse? I don't think John was a horse at this time. John tries to be a horse in this book, but it doesn't really work because he has wounds. Was horse a horse? It doesn't say. Okay, just keeping an eye out. Yeah, yeah. If I'm going to go to battle, I want to have a belly full of bread, bacon, onions, and cheese. Sounds, like, fine. That sounds pretty great, honestly. Mm. I'll give it a B. Uh, so Tyrion is about to have a trial by combat. His life is on the line. Oberyn Martell fighting Gregor Clegane. What so could happen? So we've gone from one last meal to another. Yeah, true. It's almost as though climaxes all happen at the end of the book altogether. Huh? Huh? Tyrion stabbed listlessly at a greasy grey sausage, wishing it were his sister. And then Tyrion poured himself a cup of wine and sent Podrick Payne off for cheese, bread, and olives. He doubted whether he could keep down anything heavier just now. He rose at first light, well rested, and with a hearty appetite, and broke his fast on fried bread, blood sausage, apple cakes, and a double helping of eggs cooked with onions and fiery Dornish peppers. Because I think he's just had like a conversation with Oberon and he's become more confident that he thinks he's going to survive. But then Oberon dies and Tyrion is condemned to death. And so Tyrion's breakfast came boiling back up. 
He found himself on his knees, retching bacon and sausage and apple cakes, and that double helping of fried eggs cooked up with onions and fiery Dornish peppers. Very good, George. He does the entire food description yeah. again in puke form. Well, he thought it was worth it. You know I what? I think so. The detail really does make this passage more visceral. Y- you know what I think would be hilarious? If when Tyrion pukes it up, it does the food descri- same food description, but it does it backwards. Yeah. Like it starts with the fiery Dornish peppers and then the onions and the eggs. Hmm. Or what if it like mentioned that some of it stayed down? Uh, the cheese that stayed. He kept the cheese. I think that's I think that's like A tier food. Hang on, which part are we ranking? I'm not including the puke. Oh, okay, yeah, A tier. We wh- what would you rate it with the puke? <laughs> I don't want it. <laughs> okay, that's 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 good. That's probably what that should be. Yeah. Uh, where are we here? Daenerys six. In- oh, we're, we've reached Marine. Uh, Miss Sande served her duck eggs and dog sausage and half a cup of sweetened wine mixed with the juice of a lime. The honey drew flies, but a scented candle drove them off. I would be honoured, your grace, Selmy said with a quiet dignity. I can bake apples and boil beef as well as any man, and I've roasted, roasted many a duck over a campfire. I hope you like them greasy, with charred skin and bloody bones. <clears throat> That night her handmaids brought her lamb with a salad of raisins and carrots soaked in wine and a hot flaky bread dripping with honey. So I've got a few different yeah. meals described here in Marine. Um, I just love it that Barristan is like, yeah, I'm the best sword fighter, greatest knight of my generation, but also I'm a pretty good cook. Yeah. Get you a man who can do both. Yeah. Don't settle. Yeah. Uh, how do you feel about duck eggs and dog sausage with wine and lime? So everything here is perfectly fine except for the word dog, which is a bit complicated. Yeah, I th- I feel okay about dog sausage. I think it would be fine. Yeah, I think so too. What kind of dog? Are we talking... Like, if, if, if I'm told this was a French bulldog, I'm like, oh yeah, sure, fine, I'll scarf it down. Mm. But if it's like, this was, um, this was a family beagle, his name was Buster... Mm. Um, and he was grumpy but well loved we stole him from his family on Christmas day <laughs> he was someone yeah. seeing eye dog that would make it one of the most difficult meals of my life not the most uh, I've been been places Have some. Um, everything else mm. here is great though yeah I, I are you feeling like B yeah. then yeah okay um I enjoy Barristan's description of a roast duck, greasy with charred skin and bloody bones. Well, bloody bones? Would it be bloody? Well, I think here he's kind of having a go at himself. Hmm. It's like, well, yeah, I can roast a duck, but I hope you like it charred. But he also says he does it as well as any man. Well, I suppose that his perception of the everyman isn't a very high standard. Hmm. Elitist. I think that's a B, though. Yeah. And then her handmaids bring her lamb with a salad of raisins and carrots and hot flaky bread dripping with honey. That sounds pretty good. I think that's an A. Yeah. Thanks for the super chat from Salor, who says, Hi, Glimb and Eggs. Can you say Nora smells? Well, you've just done it. Should I do it as well? Nora smells. Thanks, Salor. Was and- that worth 20 krona? <laughs> Our next food Probably. description is at Castle Black. Uh, Three Finger Hob had promised the brothers roast haunch of mammoth that night because they've just defeated the wildling army. Okay, we're going to have to talk about that. Oh, yeah, well, eating cryptids is, you know, extinct. Frowned upon. <laughs> if that was his notion, he should have found a younger mammoth, Sam thought, as he pulled a string of gristle out from between his teeth. <laughs> so, controversial point of view here, but George Martin contends that uh, old mammoth is gristly and stringy and not very nice to eat. Whereas young mammoth would be quite pleasant to eat. I imagine elephant being a bit rubbery. Don't ask me why. Probably because of the skin, right? But I imagine you wouldn't be eating the skin of the elephant. Yeah. Well, ele- I feel like elephants would be like very different mm. than other kinds of meat because they are such different animals. Like, yeah. The, like they're so big. Although, so... One of the most commonly consumed meats in our society is beef. 
And those are large, relatively sedentary uh, herbivores, right? And so are ele elephants are always on the move, actually. They probably use their muscles more than cows do. They use their brain Don't muscles, Don't quote me too. on that one. Yeah, yeah. So, I don't know, very interesting. Never considered eating elephant because of, you know, the ecological impact, but... Do you think an elephant could start a fire? I read I read a short story Fuck. about um I read a short story about the day that the bears learned how to use fire. Uh, it's just like the sort of existential horror of yeah. oh no, there's another tool using And it makes you question your own intelligence. I couldn't start a fire as well as a bear could. <laughs> I know that humankind can, but Yeah, exactly. Oh. It's like the Hitchhiker's Guide bit about how Arthur Dent is like, yeah, my species has done lots of cool things, but I don't know how to do any of them. Yeah. I can't even make a toaster. I think that that's, that's one of the things about humanity is that on our own, we're pretty useless. Who's manatee? Uh, Hugh's manatee. Hugh's manatee. Yeah. He was my math teacher. Um, <laughs> mammoth. Eating mammoth. Look, if the mammoth... Like, I'd be sad about it, but if the mammoth is already dead... Yeah, natural causes, let's say. I, I mean, I'd give no, it a go. Roadkill. Someone's run over a mammoth in their VW Golf. <laughs> um, somehow. <laughs> I'd eat it. Yeah. What, what about... Didn't oh, what, I'd try it for sure. I just don't know what it'd be like. Didn't, didn't Thomas Edison or one of those guys electrocute an elephant? Yes, it was Thomas Edison. Do you think he ate it afterwards? I don't think he did seems a waste like that's a lot of meat mm. maybe he just served it to the to the flea bottom of new jersey i'm sure there is one oh it's just it's new jersey i i think it's a c Sorry. like 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 uh, it's complicated but like there is a cool factor to eating a mammoth but there's also a sad <laughs> it's a bit of a flex there's a sad factor a sad to flex. eating a mammoth and also sam like does describe something not appetizing about it and you know if sam doesn't want to eat yeah. it yeah it's not good yeah uh so a later sam chapter uh stannis has saved the asses of the night's watch and as the black brothers entered one by one and knelt before him stannis shoved away his breakfast of hard bread, salt beef, and boiled eggs, and eyed them coldly. This one's interesting, isn't it? It's like our... Is this our first look into Stannis not eating? Uh, yeah. Because Stannis becomes, you know, a shadow of himself yeah. in these later books. Uh, and it's like he's given up his soul to Melisandre, and yeah. he's not, you know, thriving anymore. So, yeah, this simple meal that he's not eating. His vibes are off. Mm-hmm. I don't think Stannis' vibes were ever on, mm. honestly. Not at, not at the same vibrational frequency as everyone else, anyway. No, not... Yeah. Would you eat hard bread, salt beef, and boiled eggs? I, I... Like, yeah, I'd eat it. I wouldn't... I wouldn't rave about it. Yeah. Salt beef doesn't really appeal to me, like the saltiness no, of it. No, I've never been too fan. And the too. hard bread. But it makes sense in that that's, you know, for the majority of history, been the way we stored meat. Do you reckon like D or C? C. All right. All right. Now, final uh, food passage of a storm of swords. Mm -hmm. a storm of sausage. That's it. Um, John connected to Ghost's mind, a hunger he could feel it. It was food he needed, prey, a red deer that stank of fear, or a great elk proud and defiant. He needed to kill and fill his belly with fresh meat and hot dark blood. His mouth began to water at the thought. Ooh. I, I find this really interesting because it's like, you know, John, John is experiencing ghosts like fierce animal mm. hunger and violence. Like there's a violence to the bloody fresh meat. And then later on, like at the end of the da of end of dance, John makes this sort of aggressive, impulsive, violent decision to go and attack Ramsay and break his Night's Watch oaths. Mm. And I wonder if, like, the connection to Ghost makes John more animalistic and violent and impulsive. Yeah, maybe in that moment, John needs to fill his belly with Ramsay's hot, dark blood. Oof. I think that uh, John eats Ramsay is the A Song of Ice and oh, Fire theory man. that this community needed. I kind of like that. <laughs> if Br if Bran can eat Jojen, why can't John eat Ramsay? Ramsay paste, confirmed. I don't know if it would be that uh, well presented. It would not taste good. 
Um, and then we have one final passage here. Lord Snow, said Cotter Pike, if you muck this up, I'm going to rip your liver out and eat it raw with onions. Cotter Pike is strong bell was confirmed. Oh, I like it. Because Cotter Pike is in Eastwatch, which is the most convenient place ah. to travel between Westeros and Slaver's Bay, where Strong Belwas is. We never see Cotter Pike and Strong Belwas in the same room. It's true. Therefore, same person. And you know, the timeline, you know? The timeline. You just say it's the timeline and your theory works. The timeline, yes. <laughs> uh, look, I know from a very reputable spreadsheet, Google Doc, that someone wrote, who someone. isn't George... Someone made it. A very reputable spreadsheet says that the timeline proves my theory. George, who has never seen this document, would no doubt agree that this document proves my theory about the timeline. Liver and onions. Liver and onions. I don't know about raw human liver and onions. No. Can't you get sick from eating livers? Yeah. Like those Antarctic explorers eating the dog liver and getting That's sick? Right. Um, I think liver... It's too high in vitamin B, is it? Surely vitamin D for dog. Could be. Vitamin but I've also heard, like, um, you can't... Like, if, if you're eating a polar bear, first of all, what is... Like, how did you get there? Um, and second of all, you can't eat the liver because it will kill you. My God. Yeah. Because of, or like, a vitamin you, overdose. Yeah, it'll make you extremely sick because they produce so much. Maybe it is vitamin D because of the sunlight. Like, fully sick? Fully sick. Um. So, uh, uh, F. I'm. Uh, I'm gonna say E <laughs> for the onions, and like, like I don't say no to onions, and the liver might not be as bad as you say. It's like a he, raw human liver. Like he does specify raw. He does he? like the entire liver. L- the liver is the largest internal organ. You're eating a lot of human organ there. I, it, it, well, Jon Snow does not drink a lot of alcohol, so I think that his that, liver will be in good health. Liver health is affected by alcohol No, it means he's not exercising his liver. Oh. Yeah. An alcoholic's liver would be the most strong. Exactly. Well, that's the thing. I want a small, weak liver, so it's not so much raw human liver to eat. It's an F. Um, <laughs> <laughs> thank you. I don't want it. Okay. I think I think we should look at some super chats. Um, I agree, but before you do that, can you go back, go back to that and scroll out, just like zoom out one one step? Because I I wanted to make note that there are twelve hundred and eighty six people watching right now, but only four hundred and eighty five likes on the video. Well, hang on one gosh darn minute. I'm doing some mathematics in my head, but I think that some people haven't pressed that like button. Yeah, and. Honestly, I don't know about your ego, but my ego is feeling pretty unstroked at this I, moment. I I am not feeling nearly uh, like I've got enough likes. <laughs> Press that like. We've button. all been there. We Press know that, that feeling. Press that subscribe button. It's too much vitamin A. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for that the makes super sense. chats. Oh, you might want to put that on there. Thank you for the super chats, everybody. Uh, but especially. For the super chats from Jake and Loop Four X, who says I like rabbit. Thanks, Loop. And the Raccoon News Network again, keeping you informed about all raccoon-related activities. <laughs> I, I, I always want to like endorse whatever channel I see, but I don't know what yeah, is on true. these channels, so I am slightly reluctant to. Yeah. Uh, Have ra- you seen that YouTube channel of that guy who has like twenty pet raccoons? That live in his like front yard. Well, now and I he want has a to. massive ranch, and like every night he feeds them hot dogs, Amazing. and they all line up. It's very, it's the, it's fucking adorable. I think there's a Bob's Burgers episode about that. Actually. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. They like uh, keep an eye on the different raccoon characters and the dr- dramatic relationship relationships and battles that they have. King Trashmouth is one of them, I think. Oh, okay. Uh, thank you, Sabino Pereira. Hey, we didn't read what the, oh, sorry, <laughs> what the sorry, Raccoon, sorry. News, sorry. Network Raccoon News Network <laughs> says that oat cakes may refer to Staffordshire oat cakes, which are more enjoyable as a savoury, almost flat bread, very delicious with fat to fry. Mm, that sounds all right. I don't know if that is what it's referring to. Like, I, I assumed it refers to a more thick, um, you know, 
composition of oats. Mm. Kind of like a wheat bix. Sorry, a wheat bix. A wheat a wheat bike. That's correct. Wheat bike. Yeah. Sabino Pereira says that the real tragedy of the winds of winter will be the lack of food and corresponding descriptions. I don't know about that. Look, if you if you count cannibalism as a food description, I think you'll get plenty. Which I mean, so far we have been. Mm. Thank you, uh, Dally Bobali. Just want to say I fell asleep to X and Glider's vods every night. Every night. Is that why that one has millions? Has a million views? Oh, thanks, Dally Bobali. Yeah. Um, as my bedtime stories, but this is my first time getting to fall asleep to one live. Well, I, I, I hope we did it for you. We tr- you tried not to shout too much in yeah, this yeah, one. Yeah, even so. secret tunnels came up and I didn't even sing. I have never seen you use that much restraint before. <laughs> I'm very impressed. Did you see my soul almost burst out of my body? I sure did. <laughs> Be hard to miss. Thank you, Schnabeltasentier. Good job. Schnabeltasentier. Schnabel Moving passentier. on to Simco, I know that guy. <laughs> As the predominant uh, Aswai f- food scholars, you two should eat and the review um, the A Feast of Ice and Fire cookbook on our next stream. Maybe not our next stream, but I think that'd be interesting to talk about. I mean, really, we would be reviewing our cooking skills as much as we would be reviewing yeah, the recipes. But yeah, that'd be fun. Some of them are weird and like, you, you don't... I think you have to have experience to cook weird things correctly. And I don't have experience cooking weird things. Or you can do things incorrectly for That's the true. entertainment value. For the content. Throwing for content. Look, they're not going to know how it tastes. So yeah, it's we just, can say it tastes yeah, great. Yeah, unless we ship you a meal with every viewing of the video. That sounds like a fantastic like Patreon bonus. Ooh. You know? Monthly, we'll set up like a Hello Fresh or You Foods type thing where we send. <laughs> it sounds like we're just pivoting business models here. If, if we're if we're mailing refrigerated containers <laughs> of home cooked meals across the globe, look, there's going to be some cases of food poisoning. I wonder what the overhead is like on that. Yeah, it's going to be a uh, premium s- service. It's I think a super chat funded. <laughs> the margins are going to be pretty tight on that business. Uh, uh, thank you, Cordis D A, or is it Die? Um, just just for the kind words, thank you. And we have Aries Rasul who says, "Hey guys, so glad I can tune into this one live. I'm glad you made it too. What are our favorite foods, or what a food we would like to eat right now? That's a great question. What's your favorite food?" Just some caramelized onions with mushrooms and a nice, like, grainy bread. Yeah. That what you're after right now? And a tiramisu for dessert. Whoa. And a black jelly bean. Just one. It's the worst kind of jelly bean. It's got a unique flavor that I... I, I, well, yeah, I had a hankering for black jelly beans for a straight, like, five years once. And you just never satiated yourself. Well, it it never got high enough up my list right. of priorities for me to actually get around to do it. Like every other day, I was like, "Man, I would really love some black jelly beans." But it's like I there were other things for me to attend to, so right. I never actually got around to actually eating the black jelly beans until a solid five years of hankering had elapsed, and then it was pretty great. I feel like I encounter black jelly beans just by chance more often than that. How? Where? Uh, well, I did work in schools. Yeah, well, yeah, there you go. There you go. And k- kids are funny. They offer you sweets why at did, regular intervals. Why do children think that we want to take their candy? Like, I don't... Well, they saw Mr. Burns do it. <laughs> <laughs> the ultimate role model for children. Yeah. Um, as for me, my favourite food are... Oh, winkles. <laughs> <laughs> Bivalve or univalve? Bivalve. Okay. You gotta have two. You gotta have two valves in there, or else it's not a real winkle. Thanks for the super chat from Sugar Wolf, who says, Finally caught a live, actually live. Huzzah. Crazy. Also, I love that the two best got YouTubers are both also Aussies. Oh, that's a, that's an interesting who, assumption. Who are they? Yeah, who yeah, who are you? So I, I so I imagine you're talking about Aussie Man reviews there and I didn't know that Preston Jacobs was Australian. Yeah. Since when? I thought he moved to Taiwan. <laughs> oh, Cordis DA again. Thank you. Um, Gladys, I need you to know that since the book cover stream, I made reference to you in y- your book. You have, you wrote you wrote a book. A knight who gets lost and must stew a book to survive. <laughs> oh no. 
That's pretty good, though. Can you please tweet us a link to your book? Yeah, or at least a passage of it. Um, we've got Gwen Pendragon, straight from Arthurian legend, here to tell us, a fish are clade or a fish like trees as a group? That's a fantastic question, Gwen, that I don't know if the 1,200 people currently watching are here for. <laughs> Wait, hold on one minute. A fish a clade or a fish like trees? Oh, so this question has some unpacking to do. Yeah, um, I feel that. So a, cl- a clade, a phylogenetic clade, is a taxonomical group of which all descendants are a part of. Like, so there's a common ancestor, all descendants are a part of this clade. Right, like um, primates, let's say, is a clade. Sure. Um, trees are not a clade. Because the concept of tree, the tree structure, has evolved independently on various branches of the plant tree of life, which is a confusing metaphor to use, seeing as I'm talking about trees. But, um, yeah, so trees do not form a clade because they're an expression of several different branches of Yeah, there are multiple different tree things that aren't all directly yeah. directly related in so the way that simians what are. What Gwen is asking here are is um do fish form a clade where all descendants are fish or are they more like trees in that it doesn't quite work like that and to answer the question fish are a clade if you're willing to accept that all terrestrial vertebrates are fish <laughs> including yourself <laughs> Yeah, because there's probably a bunch of, like, animals that have gone in and out of the ocean over, like, Absolutely. evolutionary time, right? Like, Yeah. I, so, like, the, the old um, primary school distinction of um, just because dolphins are in the ocean doesn't mean they're fish. Well, hmm, <laughs> kind of. <laughs> um, so, fish, they do form a clade, but it, it's it's complicated. Um, but all fish that you think of as fish are related and they do share a common ancestor. Sorry for dwelling on this one for long. It's complicated and interesting. Well, I enjoyed it. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, Haveldorf says, um, top three asswife characters to have Scran with? Is this some hip S- new Scran? S- street drug that I haven't heard of? <laughs> <laughs> Am I lighting up meth with Davos Seaworth? I, I, I don't want to... I don't want to be disrespectful, but I find it funny when people spend real dollars to send a super chat, but they don't spell, like, there's typos in there, and I have nothing but gratitude for them, but I... What is Scran? Are you talking about Scranton, Pennsylvania? Oh, it just it's food. This is food. Oh. Well, I take it back. I'm is, sorry, is this, Haveldorf. Is this Scottish? Where's this from? North of England. Okay. What what is it? Food, like it's, oh, it's just a word just, for food. Yeah. Oh, so who would we like to have a meal with? Um, Robert Baratheon. Yeah, that would be fun. That would be fun. I think Tyrion would be fun if mm-hmm. Tyrion's in a good mood. <laughs> if he's time. not in the middle of one of his temper tanties. I think that Leighton Hightower and his Mad Maid would be interesting. Very interesting dinner Interesting guests. company for sure. I think Elena Tyrell would be fun. Oh yeah. Yeah, I think all of those would be great. Mm. Thanks for the super chat from Zach Cannon, who says... Beans. <laughs> Thanks for the super chat from Bloomberto, who says... I'm just getting home at 3.30am, and I'm slightly drunk, and I'm incredibly happy to catch you guys live. Greetings from Mexico. Well, greetings to Mexico. We've got a lot of drunk people coming home tuning into this one. <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> yeah. Maybe it's because we picked a, you know, Sunday or a Saturday for them, I guess. Thanks for the super chat from Shane Early, who says, Damn, now I'm hungry. Yeah, to do that. I'm getting hungry too. <laughs> yeah. Um, Elliot McKemmon says, Lovely, Love you, Glaucoid and Shaft Boy. That's good. <laughs> oh, it reminds me of um, Lava Boy and Shark Girl. <laughs> when, are we doing a, when are we doing a Lava Boy and Shark Girl review on this channel you know, i've already promised I, I don't think many people have seen this but i'm, I'm about to announce it to 1200 people live um <laughs> i i did say like a year year and a half ago maybe two years ago that when i hit a hundred thousand subscribers i was going to do a 90 minute video essay on the cars trilogy awesome yeah that sounds great doesn't it until we actually sit down and try to make it. <laughs> it's so much easier to make wild promises than to actually keep them, isn't it? Oh, sorry, we missed you, Pluvio. I made a crab pie after episode one, and it could go up against bread soaked in bacon grease any day. 
Well, you hit, we heard it here first. I thought it'd be bloody good. Yeah. Um, cooking stream featuring Gordon Ramsay Bolton. <laughs> it's fucking frozen. I um, I I am really wanting a crab pie right now. Not gonna lie. Patrick Mitchell says that a dry rat could be some good jerky. I, well, I, I I don't think that's what she meant. <laughs> yeah, I don't. Uh, yeah, I don't think it was a compliment when she said a dry rat. <laughs> oh, you want some of my dry rat? Yeah, I've got some in the pantry. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, Pistachio Freak, one hell of a name. Um, love your streams, Glidus. Oh, thank you. So humble of you to support smaller creators by streaming with them. It's true. It really is charitable of me to stream with old SwiftX, whose channel has a measly 106,000 subscribers. He's, Something like that. He's paying me an exposure. Yeah. How many... So, cumulatively, if you just add our subscriber counts up, it's like 216,000 or something like that. But I reckon it's probably only 130,000 people. I, yeah, it yeah. would be really fascinating. And this really should be like a feature in YouTube analytics. Yeah, like the if we can... exact per shared percentage of audience. Because I, I suspect that the Venn diagram of people who subscribe to Glidus and the people who subscribe to Alt Swift X is almost a circle. It's like a circle, but you've crossed your eyes. <laughs> yeah, kind of blurry circle. Yeah. You thought that Pistachio Freak was a good name, but Ambassador Ass Eater is here to tell you that I eat humans all the time. It's good to know. And thanks, Kyle Faulkner. And yeah. thank you, Boki Malau, who says that part three will be Glidus describing how the winds of winter taste. Uh, part three will be Feast for Crows and Dance with Dragons, mate. Or it might take a stream each for It could Feast be. And Those Dance, are possibly. large books. Yeah. And George really gives it his all when it comes to the cannibalism he sure does gavin davis or perhaps gavin davis <laughs> says this is the first time i've made a stream you haven't made it mate you're watching it i've been watching hey for about a month and i Back off, blame youtube for getting me into the game of thrones fandom is this a fandom are we fans i thought we were just weirdos i just got the first <laughs> book on audible and it's way darker than i'd expected oh mm. it's gonna get darker oh yeah I hope you enjoy Roy Detrice's pronunciations of everything. Brain <laughs> of Toph. <laughs> Pitaya. Baelish. Uh, thank you, Joseph K. Lee, who says, Do they have yogurt in A Song of Ice and Fire? They have cheese, butter, and milk. They even mention ice cream-like concoctions. So where's the yogurt? Do they have yogurt? Uh, I'll have does, a look. Does it come in tubes? That you just like squeeze directly into your mouth. <laughs> Apply directly to far. Uh, while he's doing that, uh, thank you, Queensland Australia, uh, for the uh, two dollars twenty New Zealand. There's no H in yogurt, is there? Um, not in the American spelling, I believe. Uh, there is no mention of yogurt in a song of ice and fire. There you go. Or if it is, it's not described using the word yogurt. Mm, yeah, maybe it's got some like... Well, I mean, fermented mare's milk that's always talked about. Maybe that could become yogurty. I, it could if you left it out long enough. Yeah. yeah. But so could any milk. Yeah, well, there's no mention of yogurt in Westeros, <laughs> but there's also no definitive proof that there isn't yeah. yogurt in Westeros. And you can't prove a negative. Therefore, yes, there's yogurt. Mm. Um, You might want to refresh the page because I don't think it keeps up. Uh, okay. I think this yeah, should same. be updated. Oh, should it? That's good. Yeah, yeah, let's let's cut to Streamlabs. Uh, oh yeah. my god, we're so far behind still. Can we show... Oh, we can whoa. show this. Yeah, now. yeah, we can show that. That's fine. <laughs> we're so far behind. Oh my god. Thank you for all the generous <laughs> super chats, yeah, folks. It really does um, stagger one's brain. Yeah, so we're up to there. Two hours ago. <laughs> we're two hours behind on super chats? Yes. <laughs> Thank you so much, Hydra Seven Hundred Seven. Oh my God, Holy fifty dollars! Thank you so much, Jesus. Another Louises. fifty. Got to get Gladys some good old <laughs> what? What? Go pothole noodles? <laughs> okay, I unretract my earlier statement. <laughs> if you're gonna give us fifty dollars, go pod. <laughs> <laughs> go pothole noodles. I love it. Maybe I'll try and find them after this watering chat about fictional food. Thank you, Hydra707. Thank you, Hannah Anderson, who says, Truly no better way to start a Sunday than a stream with you two. Oh, that's so nice to say. Thank you, Mambo Rambo, who says, Yes, I'm awake. Thanks a lot for your streams. 
Nice. Belladonna says, um, is Mormons raven referring to food or corn? That being the, uh, you know, music band. I think that's a fantastic question. Although it's spelled with a C. Um, there are publishing errors such as um, a fowl being spelled with a U instead of a W when um, Crescent is, you know, a bird. Well, look, Gladys, I mean, it's a raven. It doesn't know how to spell. Yeah, true. It isn't a fowl, though. It's a passerine. Um, Dirk Ravensburg <laughs> says, Love me some Gladys and shifty goodness. There's a C in there, but no W. Uh, well, look. Is this someone else? To be perfectly honest, not even I can consistently <laughs> I, I spell that old shift X correctly, <laughs> so it's uh, fair. Uh, thank you, Patrick Mitchell. Some herbivores will chomp down on bone and even kill. Yeah, I mentioned this earlier. Kill slash eat down small anim- mammals if certain resources are low. Or if it's just convenient for them. I've seen a deer eat um, a little chick. That was gruesome that sounds very upsetting thank you matias chendez for um tolerating my shit pronunciation of your name <laughs> and for saying why didn't the night's watch send a raven to house uber eats <laughs> <laughs> i mean they the overhead on paying for a delivery driver to go north of the wall to yeah, get to craster's yeah. keep where's the nearest like sit down restaurant well, I, I, I think Town. I, I think the person running the deliveries is Gendry, and he is pretty persistent <laughs> when it comes to uh, Arctic food deliveries and such. Oh, I like this question. Emily Forsberg asks you: Have oh you listened to Materia? And what's your favourite song? I have listened to Materia. He was actually one of the first people to listen to it. Yeah, it's been, it's been a while since I've heard the album because I think I got a sneaky preview <laughs> peek. Oh, I got... like I like Greenland. You like Greenland? I think that's my favourite Materia oh, song. That's cool. I I just like the ones where uh, Gladys gets to hit the high notes. I think it's that one fun. does have the highest note on the album. It sure so does. You know how to pick them. Thank you, the guy who is Australian, hmm. who says, "How many times do you think dripping grease is mentioned in the Wild Card series? And can you get beef and bacon pies at Brumbies? Oh, you can. It says Ooh. the Brumbies. Is that a chain? I don't know. Um, so George only edits wild cards. I think he's contributed a few stories over the years, but he mainly just edits the series. But I imagine that what he's editing is the words dripping grease into all of the stories. So I think, I think, I think, by, something. I think by editing, George means inserting the phrase <laughs> dripping grease into every other sentence in wild cards. Mm. And since no one that I know has ever read wild cards, it might be so. Yeah. There's no way of knowing we, we should, like, read some wild cards at some point just to... It could actually be very fun. It might be. Um, but also, I don't want to encourage George. So. <laughs> Smeagol asks, have we ever played the Game of Thrones game by Cyanide Studios? Oh, that's the 2012 one, I think, that said at the um, Night's Watch at the beginning. I have plans to play that sometime soon over on <laughs> twitch.tv slash Gladys Live. Um, no, I haven't played it. Have you played it? I, I had a I had a little look see at one point. I didn't continue with it. it it'll be fun to like play it together and figure it out. Because um, yeah, like it seems like one of the less bad Game of Thrones official games. So it'd be interesting to check it out. Mm. That's why I wanted to find out was if there are any that are like actually just really good. And this one might be. I've mm. heard it is. Mm. Um, Lord Mud, who is still alive somehow. Um, says, greetings, Lord Swift and Sir Gla- Get fucked. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to ask, what kind of food do you think they have in Ashai? I can't believe someone spells Swift correctly for the first time in a blue moon, but they get Glimbo wrong. No, no, I'm sure they meant Glumbo, but they called me, like, you get to be a lord, and I'm stuck over here just being a knight. Mm. I don't make the rules. <laughs> um, what kind of food they have in Ashai and the Shadowlands in general? Don't they say that they, like, import their food? Because nothing have, like, grows, yeah. There's just, like, radioactive blind fish in the rivers and stuff. Like Blinky from Springfield. An inedible ghost grass. Yeah. Eat too much ghost grass, you'll start glowing. So, yeah, you'd imagine that they just import everything. But what could grow there? Um, bad things. Bad things. Dragons, uh, pestilence? maybe? Dragons and pestilence. Maybe uh, sh- shadow of the evening, shade of the evening trees. 
Yeah, we don't know where that comes from, do we? Mm. Hmm. Mukpur 200 says, um, what do you think about the theory that Ashara equals patch face? <laughs> <laughs> also, um, Robert Strong also is um, Ashara. <laughs> your streams are great. Best thing to start a day. Well, thank you for saying that after saying that. Um, I think it's been made quite clear what we think of that theory. <laughs> I, I mean, look, if Ashara wanted to hide her identity tattooing her face with motley is a pretty good way of hiding her beautiful features true and also becoming a fat man um that would do it too and then pretending to drown i mean look here's the thing ashara threw herself into the sea ah, from i know i know from stoffel and then she washed up on the beach at shipbreaker bay which is merely a short paddle around oh the continent God. and only like a couple years before she threw herself off that tower. Well, clearly it's a time travel yeah. ocean under Starfall. Is there a time traveling like vortex whirlpool? At if we get to the Torrentine in the future and there's like a freaky whirlpool there, maybe that's where Euron's trying to summon his Cthulhu monster. Because the Cthulhu monster is actually Bran from the future. Just cracked this case wide open. Solved. Thank you for the super chat from Zimmerman <laughs> Who says, theory, fungus creating networks in cheese is a metaphor for the weirwoods creating networks in Westeros. Are the weirwoods actually fungal? Do they literally eat their blood sacrifices? I'm going to hand that one I to you. I think that's really fun. That's, <laughs> that's a great idea. Because, yeah, the way you talk about it, um, the weirwoods being connected all together like that, that's not really how plants do, is it? Um, each individual tree is its own distinct organism from the other trees in the forest. Sure, they collaborate on things much the way that humans do. But um, funguses, um, a lot of what we might think of as trees are actually, you know, um, uh, limbs of the one organism. There's a massive aspen forest in um, America somewhere. I think its name is Pando. Um, and it's it's enormous it's the largest organism on the planet by some metrics and it's one big fungus because those trees aren't actually trees or maybe i'm thinking of a different thing and that's actually just a cloned tree that actually it's weird and complicated but yes um all of them are actually being connected as the one organism um westeros has a lot of weird subterranean shit going on there are caves everywhere there's so many caves in Westeros. Um, tune in to uh, Ranking Every Cave uh, coming up next. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I've always been a little confused, though. Like, are people suggesting that the weirwoods of Westeros are literally physically connected through their roots across thousands of miles underground? I had never thought about it like that. Because, like, uh, people have talked about the weirwoods being connected and, like, sure, like, magically. Yeah. But not physically, right? Although, I mean, I like, maybe there's an outside shot, but I doubt it. It's a pretty long way. Yeah. Um, the other thing about weirwoods being fungal is that they have leaves. I don't know if funguses do the whole leaf thing. And sap? Do funguses yeah. have sap? Nah. Nah. So, I, I, yeah, I, 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 yeah, I think that... It's easy to go too far with, like, the weirwood network interconnection, but, like, it, it it's a psychic magic thing that stores the souls of dead green seers mm. and children of the forest. I and... love the idea of them literally eating their blood sacrifices, though. Well, I mean, in White Tree, there's that weirwood that has mm. a mouth-shaped hollow with human bones inside of it. And then um, at the Black Gate... Um, the mouth, yeah. Yeah, you literally... Uh, walk through the mouth of the old gods to submit yourself to the wall. That's what happens down there. You're literally making yourself a sacrifice to the weirwoods there. Yeah. I also really liked the idea that, you know, Ned Stark always cleans his sword under the weirwood tree in the heart the, so in, that in the god's wood. Blood? So that the blood from the sword goes down to the roots of the weirwood. And Ooh. so, incidentally, Ned is making blood sacrifice to the old gods every time he executes someone. Sure. Mm. Weirwoods are cool. Yeah. James Liper says, hang on, is that a P? Yeah, it is. Um, streaming the book on St. George's Day. What could it mean? 
I've no idea. That's the day when he man killed the dragon. Oh. For England. They killed the lizard. They killed the dragon. Oh. For England. Also, Susie Dent is based. Um, yeah, she's really cool. Um, her books are incredibly boring, though. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, the the food descriptions are not really that impressive. Oh my god, it's Glider Snow. My son, your I bastard oft, son. I wondered oft what had become of you. <laughs> uh, mutton sounds good. Haven't eaten since Dad left. Oh my goodness! I taught you to hunt. He gave you the skills to survive, Glider Snow. <laughs> you you gave him your name. Yeah. Your first what else name. could you ask for? Yeah. Your name. Your skills. He should be a dragon YouTuber by now. Yeah, what are you doing? <laughs> Get it together. Um, Agreeable Witch says, The rat cook always makes me think of the Greek myth of Tantalus. Like It's like a strange opposite version of the story. Oh, Great God. stream like always. Because the rat is always eating his young, but is always hungry. Mm. Oh my yeah. God. Yeah. That's horrifying. George does that a lot, um, like invoking classical stories and tropes, but flipping them. Making them all backwards and upside down, Lee. I, I think that George Martin is evoking the ancient allegory of the Simpsons episode where uh, Homer is forced to eat donuts and donuts and donuts until he hates donuts, but he actually just keeps on eating the donuts and he's fine. What's interesting about that one is it's not actually canonical because it's part of a Treehouse of Horror segment. True, yeah. yeah. So it also is a fantasy, um, a, a mem like a, a song, you might say. Of both ice and fire. Well, yes, because ice the from icing, the glazing of the, the iced donuts. I love how <laughs> it didn't take a moment for us to come to the exact same conclusion there. And of course, he's burning in hell. Yeah. So there you go. That's the real song of ice and fire. Amazing. We got wins from where we least expected it. The Simpsons. <laughs> George definitely would appear on The Simpsons. Surely he has already. Hasn't he? I, I think I just stopped paying attention to The Simpsons at a certain point, but I'd, I'd be surprised if George hasn't been on The Simpsons. Thanks for the super chat from Tater Nuts, who says, Genitalia description tier list next, or I unsub. It's not worth it. Yeah. See ya. I, there's only... <laughs> I, I, I mean, I'm already running through the, the, uh, the descriptions in my mind. I mean, nothing beats the fat pink mask. Yeah. Um, I think the swamp is also of note. S tier, yes. I think that uh, Tyrion's genitalia has an interesting description, but yeah, I think that's about it. I don't want it. I don't want it. Described as quote angry and purple, if I recall correctly. Ah, yeah. I've, I've seen politicians like that. <laughs> um, Andrew Williamson says, "Love your work. Uh, love your vids. Sorry. Always listen at work. My coworkers ask what's funny, and I don't have the time to explain the rich lore of Tyrion Lannister." Yeah, that's the problem. Um, much like a cult, it takes a lot of uh, prior knowledge to really grasp the um, beauty of what's going on here today. What job could possibly be more important than explaining the rich lore of Tyrek Lannister? Yeah, you know Lannister? what? Your co-worker's time isn't that important. You can explain it I think to their them. priorities are all wrong. Yeah. Thanks for the super chat from Foy, who says, Hands of gold are always cold, but Glider's hands are warm. First stream I've caught live. Thanks for this. My hands are, like, always quite warm. Hmm. So I don't know why you knew that, but thank you. Thanks for the super chat from Dag Hagmark, who says, Please continue your playthrough of Telltale's Game of Thrones. Are we going to continue that? Uh, you didn't seem interested in doing it anymore. I just found it difficult it was to talk really difficult. over a game that was all about talking. Because the whole point of this is, you know, our thoughts on things. And the game just doesn't stop. It just keeps talking. Yeah, shut up. And we're, we're, you... um, we're not done riffing on the last thing you said. <laughs> and then we had to keep looking into buckets of maggots and stuff. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, yeah. We could do it. It's just a bit... We've got important food descriptions to cover. Yeah. I wasn't happy with that stream we did, really. I know a lot of viewers were, but uh, they don't matter. Or just the audio balance. Like, I felt like the the sound like oh, was yeah. too loud and the thing was... It's well, a... that's an easy fix, though. Yeah. Well, yeah, maybe we'll have another go at some maybe. point. When we've run out of other ideas, which, I mean, you guys haven't seen our document, but um, 
I keep thinking that we're scraping at the bottom of the barrel, but then I find more, there's more bottom to the barrel than oh, I yeah. thought. This bot- this barrel keeps going. This, is this ex- maggots all the way down. This is an expansive bottom. <laughs> I'll say that. <laughs> um, gl- oh, my, my son. I'm still waiting for father to come home. You sent that, like, less than an hour after the first one. Like, we've been waiting for a book for 12 years. Surely you can wait that long again for me to come home. Maybe your bastard children can ally with my bastard children and they can form a orphanage where they can pool their resources. That'd be good. That'd be nice. Uh, John T. Savage, Savage asks if uh, Littlefinger might rape Sansa because that was the Persephone and Hades situation. I don't think that will happen. I, I think that some kind of assault might happen. and Because mm, what you've said there is what happens in the myth. Yeah. What George... I mean, what we're doing here is extrapolating the future based on what George has tended to do in the past. He recites the myth... A little twisted. No? Well, yeah, yeah. George is not imitating Greek myth word for word. It's just about evoking an idea or a feeling or a concept. And so, yeah, it's... I wouldn't expect that. Thank you, Ibelin O.R., who says, The liver that was promised. Born of salt and smoke. Oh, I guess it makes sense, Mm. yeah. Of Ares and Rayala's line. Hmm. Thank you, Wiki Ramblings, who says, Last time you skipped Tyrion's meal of crabs yeah. with the Night's Watch High Command. Please rank crabs. Um, crabs are S tier. S tier um, crabs. As both a food and an animal. Yeah, it's true. That, that, that's one of the most fun and memorable food related scenes is when Tyrion yeah. engages Alyssa Thorne in a duel with a crab fork. Do you want to find it? Uh, yeah, we can do that. Yeah, you, you do that you while I reading. read Tyrone Lancaster, whose name is so very almost a Game of Thrones character. Hey Glidus, when is the episode 9 bliss take coming out? I need to sur- see the vertical Kool-Aid man. I do indeed make that joke once more in that video. Um, which should be coming out... Um, it'll be up for patrons, I hope, within a week. And then it'll be out on YouTube whenever YouTube lets me release it. So, wow, I actually gave a concrete... Oh, that's such a terrible idea. I'm not supposed to say when I think things might be done. You are setting a dangerous precedent, yeah. Gladys, of uh, setting deadlines and then following them, which is not a promise that a YouTuber should make. For your... Uh, well, let, well let, let's do the rest of the Super Chats. Okay. And then we'll wrap this up with a crab discussion. Crab How review. about that? Yep. Um... Thanks for the super chat from Kai, who sends a love heart. Oh, thanks, Kai. Thanks for the super chat from SRAF78, who says, If Glidus makes a sci-fi channel, please call it Astroglidus. Is there a pun there that I'm missing, or is it just kind of cool? We've talked about food for three hours straight, so I'm sorry if we don't understand your puns. <laughs> thanks for the super chat from Adam Smith, who says, Greasy chin borrows for life. Yeah, yeah, me and my mates, we meet up every week to, like, smack our chins together after slathering them with grease. That sounds way more sensual than it was at the start of this sentence. <laughs> like, I was not setting out to make it such. Thanks for a super chat from Marcella Deliveria, which is a name I have seen before, who says, Either of you have a favourite theory on the other's motivations? I, I enjoy, like, I've seen Joe Magician did a video about the idea that the White Walkers are searching specifically for a Stark, and the idea that, like, Waymar Royce looks a bit like a Stark, and the Starks have, like, a Stark look that, like, Craster recognizes, and this idea that the others are searching for John because he's the prince that was promised, and, like, the idea of he was a baby promised to the others, and a baby of ice and fire, and the others need to take human babies to make them into White Walkers, and... And they think that turning him into one is going to be some glorious thing for them and their people. Yeah. Okay. It, it's, it's very vague, but I, I do enjoy that, like, line of reasoning, even though I don't think there's a heap of evidence for it yeah it's cool it's ice cold nice why do you think the others came now i think uh i think so i've heard these ideas of there being an even bigger even northerner threat that's driving them kind of like how like there's been a reveal that you you know that the wildlings were coming south because of their bigger northerner threat yeah i don't think george is going to pull that twice though especially this late in you don't think the whiter walkers are chasing (laughs) the white walkers 
it's actually a whole it's like an all robberous because essos connects to westeros from the north and it's actually the et issue we're driving the white walkers south i into like westeros. it i like yeah. it and it turns out that it's daenerys pushing east that's making that happen well anyway that's me. not what i think <laughs> <laughs> uh so i i'm hoping that the other's motivations are as complex as the human characters of the story and I hope that there'll be an opportunity for the characters to reflect on that. Yeah. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I guess, like, we, we kind of got an answer, as much as I'm loath to admit it, in the in the, in the the throne games. Uh, the Dragon Show, it was called by the, then. The, the Dagger Experience on the home box office network, um, where they said that the White Walkers were created by the Children of the Forest to fight the humans who were the aggressors. What, so they're still just biologically programmed to continue doing that? Yeah, like a, you know... That's such an unsatisfying answer, though, isn't it? Yeah, I, I mean, like a lot of things in the show, it, it was done in an unsatisfying way, but, like, maybe the books will go a little I deeper that, into it. So the White Walkers, uh, I'm just going to make fun of Game of Thrones for a moment here, if you'll indulge no, me. No, we don't do that here. <laughs> um... So, the White Walkers are, like, the central existential plot element for the majority of the show's run. They are, like, the preeminent antagonists of one of the main character's stories for his entire existence. And this reveal to the nature of their existence, the nature of their being, that they were created by the Children of the Forest to combat the men during the war uh, for the back then... Um, Happens in season six, episode five, and is never mentioned again. <laughs> happens three years before the show ended. But Gladys, we got we got that thrilling dialogue about how in the final season about how the White Walkers represent memory and forgetting, and they want us to forget our stories. And don't you know there's nothing more God, important than a good so, story? So close to what George might actually say, though. It sounds like a parody but of what like, George might write. But, but George would think it through. And, yeah, and follow through. Um, and we also got the cave drawings in Season 7 where John got a chalk kit out and scrawled on the wall to convince Daenerys to let him use his, <laughs> her dragons. I love that theory. Yeah, yeah. Look, I, I, I don't know about the White Walkers. It's been so long that it's one of those things that George has probably changed his mind about five times. Like, I think people underestimate how much George has changed his mind since 1996 when he wrote a Game of Thrones. I know that I th I think the exact same thing as I did back in 1996. Yeah, I still yeah. think, wow, yeah. I'm hungry. Fetch me a nipple. <laughs> <laughs> can, can anyone listening think of a thought that they had in 1996 that's like exactly the same? Like a plan that they had that has been completely consistent. A plan that they have carried out. Is there a plan that you have completed and concluded and executed in the year 2023 that you conceived of in 1996. And that, that plan has, not has been changed. unchanged since then. Like, no. Nah. No. And like, yeah, I I don't know. I, I, I think that it would be perfectly acceptable if the White Walkers are just this sort of seasonal, magical, destructive force that was created by a magical mishap by the Children of the Forest. And now it's just this thing this dangerous force that we have to contend to because you know th that that's real that exists nature and natural forces and natural disasters are things that it's also um another piece of george's commentary on the notion of revenge because mm. the they're, if they're created for True. a weapon to exact you know countenance upon men by True. the children of the forest then that's the children of the forest who in the show go extinct because of the white walkers and something similar may happen in the in the books, unclear. But I, if that is the case, I really hope that Leaf is still around to answer for her people. Absolutely. Yeah. No, I completely agree with that because yeah, like like with that um, Alaria Sand dialogue, you know, George is so interested in the idea of mm. revenge and war and conflict being this cyclical intergenerational curse that we inflict upon ourselves. And you're right. Like, if the children of the forest are destroyed by the White Walkers that they use to fight the humans with... It's kind of the end of that story element. Yeah. 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 I, maybe what sets Bloodraven and Bran apart, then, would be that Bloodraven sees this happen. He sees Leaf regretting the actions of her people in doing this or justifying 
um, those actions and thinks the revenge was justified and revenge is good and we need to do it to do, you know, all the things that I think are necessary. But Bran thinks revenge killed my family. Yeah. Yeah, that could be, like, the element that, that, that the well, young maybe, Bran... maybe we see that slip away from Bran in that moment. I don't know. Yeah, I'm I, just yeah. riffing off the top of my head, and all of my ideas are better than Dave and Dan's. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I think those are really great points. I, I think one of the counterpoints, though, is that, like, the characterization of the Children of the Forest and of Leaf is so, like, kind of minimal and weird that it's, like... I Like, Leaf is not enough of a character yeah, for it yeah. to have emotional resonance. Like, when she says, oh, yeah, 8,000 years ago, <laughs> my people, like, accidentally cooked up this spicy, icy fellas in a test tube and now they're wreaking havoc. It's like, well, okay. Like, that was sort of everyone's reaction to the revelation in Season 6 of the, of the D- Dan and Donkey show when they said that it was the... It was the Leafy Boys who did it. Like, I think most of the audience did not have much of a reaction to that like, revelation huh? because what? we okay. don't r- know anything about the Children of the Forest or the White Walkers or those ancient times. So it's like, it's it, it was just a wet fart of a reveal. Hold on, I'm theorizing. I'm about to do a theory. I'm going to theory all over <laughs> the place. Um, so Ew. White Walker activities um, in recent times, we don't know of any of them like before. Like, it hasn't been happening for decades, has it? The wildlings say that they've been attacked and displaced for years. Years. That could mean decades. Yeah, I don't... I could look up. So, the common thread most people um, go to when they think of that is um, Craster. Craster has been giving his children to them, and that's, like, emboldened them or given them enough power to actually disrupt wildling life. But, like, really, like, I think, just Craster's offspring created yeah. enough White Walkers to... I think... Well, how long has Blood Raven been at the wall? I think that... Well, I'm thinking that possibly Blood Raven's plan or his actions are even larger in scope than this. And he's using... Ah, oh, fuck. What am I even saying? Do I have any backing for this? Probably not. Um, that Blood Raven might be pushing them south for some reason you think blood raven is behind the white walker i don't know it's kind of a bit um twirly mustache well i mean i i think you're not crazy to think that maybe the children of the forest are causing the white maybe walkers they're controlling, to go south yeah, yeah. because the children of the forest want humans to go extinct so that the children of the forest can take back westeros for and themselves maybe blood raven being up there gave them the access to blood raven's that. powerful and and blood raven is human so maybe he's like the vector they need to be able to connect with other humans like bran yeah like could leaf or children of the forest get into bran's head and convince bran in the same way that blood raven can like i think the idea that you know blood raven is this guy who's used so many people as a puppet mm. he's this brutal machiavellian dude it's so poetic for blood raven to be used in turn by the children of the forest a, a greater power so than he they use blood raven to get bran up there bran yeah. being the most powerful green seer in a billion years yeah and they're going to use bran to dot 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 yeah well i mean that's what that was one of the weird things about late bran in the HBO show is that he was so creepy and weird and unhelpful and inhuman. <laughs> He's so useless. So it's like, if that's the direction that it's going, like, yeah, maybe Bran is this... Because Bran says, I'm not Bran anymore in the mm. TV show. So it's like, maybe Bran, the intent of the Children of the Forest is to dehumanize Bran and to use him as this magical tool that they can use to weaken humanity and empower the White Walkers and warg a dragon. Because that's the thing. If the Children of the Forest want the White Walkers to destroy humanity... The children of the forest do not want any dragons coming along Mm. and destroying the White Walkers, do they? So maybe Bran is partly a tool to skin change into dragons to protect the White Walkers from dragons. Could be. Uh, So... So... There is indications in the text that it's been years that the wildlings have been attacked by White Walkers. Right. Um... They grow stronger as the days grow shorter and the nights colder. First they kill you, then they send your dead against you. The giants have not been able to stand against them, nor the Thens, the Ice River clans, the Hornfoots. Nor you, nor me, says Mance. I've come with my tail between my legs to hide behind the wall. Um, so, 
Yeah, admittedly, that doesn't say years or decades. That, that just... to me, sounds like it's only happened within this past seasonal cycle. Yeah, maybe like since last winter. Because, you know, it, it's been a long summer. Yeah, and, true. And, and Mance mentions the days getting shorter and that's what's making them more powerful. Yeah. Yeah, to me, I mean, yeah, th- that does sound like years, but yeah, it could be like a few years and that's still the end well, of the it, summer. Well, it still is quite yeah. a few years. The last decade was... Uh, the last winter was over a decade ago. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It could definitely be, like, this winter is the one where the White Walkers are coming. Mm. Um, and, yeah, Craster. I, I, I mean, I mean, I mean, not to get too deep into it, but, like, there's, there's, like, the genetics component of it because A Song of Ice and Fire is interested in, like, who has skin changing blood who has the blood of the first man who has the blood blood of the the old gods who has the blood of the dragon who has the weird dane blood whatever whatever that is the blood of ice and fire um i wonder if you know the white walkers are taking babies and making new white walkers surely the blood of those babies matters like if they Mm. get a baby who has the blood of the green seers and the old gods a stark say maybe that is what gives them the power and like from the Game of Thrones show, it seemed like the White Walkers control the Whites in a process like not dissimilar to skin changing and walking, yeah, right? Sure. And George Martin has written stories like Meat House Man about a person who psychically controls corpses. So it's not unreasonable to think that the White Walkers control the Whites, the zombies, with what is basically skin changing power. Yeah. And so maybe they need to acquire skin changes, human skin changes, to turn into White Walkers in order to control the army of the dead. So maybe it's about who who Craster is breeding with, or who or whoever who Craster's is. possible father might have been. Yeah, because some people like the idea that Bloodraven is the father. Well, of it's mentioned that his father was a crow. Yeah. What color is Craster's hair? Oh god, he's an old man. No, it does say what color his hair is, though. Okay. I'm pretty sure it does. If uh, one second. Uh, a mane of all right, yeah, grey hair going to white. Yeah, okay. Yeah, so could be silvery grey. Yeah, but that looks similar to grey. <laughs> mm, yeah, okay. Yeah, we don't know. Yeah, but yeah, I, yeah, I like your implication that because like then those babies would not only have, um, I mean, Blood Raven's weirdly magical. Like, um, not only does he have the blood of the dragon, he's also able to do all of this weird dreamy shit in the weirwood. Um, roots. Yeah, Blood Raven is undoubtedly an exceptional individual with the power of both the old gods and the Targaryen mm. dragon blood. So maybe, yeah, the um, donations of Crass's children could be enough to have spared all this on. And wouldn't it be hilarious if the apocalyptic zombie apocalypse was sweeping across Westeros ultimately because Blood Raven got horny and yeah. had sex with a wildling? I mean, that also like seems to be something George is focused on absolutely is how um people's obsession with their loved ones causes destruction across their lives and others but it's like the most human thing to do is destroy yourself because of love yeah 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 love is the death of duty and 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 one of like blood raven story in particular is one that is it's about high politics and it's about high magic but it's also about a man who loved a woman who also happened to be his half sister. Yeah, it's about like fucked up sexual relationships yeah. and really messed up family relationships and like it would kind of be perfectly thematic if Blood Raven fathered Craster and then Craster gave magic babies to the White Walkers and mm. caused the apocalypse. I kind of love it. Wins, please. <sighs> Wait a minute. So the idea of <laughs> Um, inadvertently killing your own children is that happens a lot in George's work. Yeah, bail the bar. Blood Raven warged Mormont's Raven, screamed corn in the in the hall, causing the mutiny, killing his own son. Well, Craster didn't die at the mutiny, but it caused the circumstances that led to the, that led to um Craster's death. Wait, how does Craster die again? Uh, well, in the show. <laughs> yeah, I'm confused. Uh, I don't think it's portrayed. Is it? It's um. No, well, I, it's I, when I, they come back. I think in the show, Craster died when around the time Jord died, didn't he? Um, uh, in 
the show. Hang on. Yeah, yes. Hmm. No, oh, Rast kills Craster in the show. There, there is also that other idea um, that Craster's child with Gilly is taken mm. south yep. by Sam to Old Town. Yep. And the idea that the White Walkers want the baby that was promised to them back because that son of Gilly's was meant to was intended to yeah. be sacrificed to the White Walkers. So it would be really hilarious if all the White Walkers wanted was Gilly's baby. And they just take that and go home. Does that explain what had been happening previously though? Well, I mean, I like the idea that there was a pact and like the Black Gate in the Night Fort was built to facilitate agreed yeah. sacrifices to the White Walkers. Um, and that pact was broken. And, you know, there must always be a Stark in Winterfell, could be part of that deal. And, you know, now that there's no longer a Stark in yep. Winterfell... Both parts of that pact have been broken. And they're no longer getting the babies they were promised. And, you know, of course, you know, in the show, the White Walkers never talk. But in the books, the White Walkers speak in their own language mm. and they laugh. So, you know, the others are more humanized. They are actually, like, speaking, reasoning um, David J. Peterson actually developed some White Walker speech that they never used. Really? Yeah. Interesting. Should we move on? <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. I don't know if $10 was um, worth all of that discussion. No. <laughs> Yeah, no, that, you know, no, that, yeah, no, that was good. That, I, yeah, I want to think more about White Walkers. Yeah, maybe we should dedicate more thinking to that. Mm. Um, we've got V, um, who says, "What is spelling for? Anybody you knew that uses it?" Look, you've proven your point, V. It probably doesn't matter if we spell stuff wrong. I know that I spell stuff wrong. I'm spelling stuff wrong right now. <laughs> I actually do this all through text to speech. Like Stephen Hawking. Yeah, we are actually both AI voices. Oh. Like Stephen Hawking. D don't even say it. That's going <laughs> to... creeps me out, the AI yeah. stuff. Um, Jake Geffen says, What is the most cringy scene in A Song of Ice and Fire? Love from Florida, where I came home from the club hours ago. Lots of people coming up. Oh, backyard is flooded with alligators in it. You should probably tend to that, mate. I am Darkstar. And I am of the night. No, 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 no. That's the coolest scene. You've got it all backwards. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. What's, what, what's the cringy the scene? Cringiest scene. Uh, some of like Tyrion's stuff when like yeah, like he's a bit of a milady tips fedora. Um, he, he comes. He's a bit incelly at times. Yeah, Tyrion has a very large dose of why doesn't everyone love me and want to fuck me? Not you, Penny. <laughs> <laughs> and, and like sometimes George is like critical of Tyrion and sometimes George is sympathetic of Tyrion even when Tyrion is being horrible and it's kind of like what, what, what's going on here like you know who are we really siding with with Tyrion and of course you know he is meant to be very complicated and he is very complicated and he's a wonderful character but like there's definitely bits where it's like eh, I don't, I don't, I'm, not, I'm not siding with Tyrion here but I feel like George is yeah, and well, that is kind of you reading the author's intent of a passage, and like you can make a good guess for sure. I mean, I mean, I mean, honestly, I mean, the most cringy scenes in A Song of Ice and Fire are like the descriptions of like fourteen-year-old Daenerys's breasts. They're the sex scenes for sure. There's a lot of that, and a lot of that, I'm like, ah, eh, come on, I, I don't yeah, want to read this. You could have just yeah. said that this happened and moved on. Um, Tiny Space Goat, what a great name, says, but what if I just can't tell when I misspell words? Um, then it doesn't matter. Yeah. It's fine. You are absolved. Yeah. <laughs> Kevin Lee says, thanks for the content, alternative rock enjoyer and alternative Swift X. I like it. Is that what I am? <laughs> <laughs> You're the alternative Swift X. For sure. You don't want to see the original Swift X. Uh, what, what we did. Swift X Prime. <laughs> we don't speak of Swift X Prime. Thank you, Basilgate, or shall I say, Basilgate, Thank you. who says, about to eat a calzone, or should I sell, should I say, calzone? <laughs> you just misspelled something out of your mouth. <laughs> <laughs> While listening to this, and I couldn't be happier. Love you guys. Thank you, Basilgate. Enjoy the stream enjoy and the calzone. enjoy your calzone. Yeah. Thank you, uh, Joseph Kosteniuk, who says, New theory, 
Melisandre knows that Jon Snow was Azor Ahai all along and is playing Stannis all along to help him. She'll sacrifice Stannis because there's power in King's Blood. I really enjoy the Arsewife theories that say that a character is so devious that they have not only tricked everyone else around them, but they have tricked themselves in their own mind. Mm. And the passages from Melisandre's like point Cersei of view... Like how Cersei killed John Arryn. Like how Cersei killed John Arryn, but she convinced herself yeah. that she didn't. Uh, Self-gaslighting. Um... Because the the Mel yeah the the Melisandre chapter she's like she thinks Stannis is Azor Ahai mm. and she is really confused why her God keeps showing Ellen her these Snow. visions of Jon Snow whenever she searches for Azor yeah. Ahai. It's that so very weird. much reads as someone who's um, convinced of their dogma having to confront um, evidence to the contrary. Yeah, faith versus physics. Yeah, uh, I mean I I mean here's a thought that I haven't had is that like. Melisandre also has a vision of Bloodraven and Bran in that same passage when she has the visions of Jon. And I wonder if you could speculate that the reason why she's having visions of Jon when she's searching for Azor Ahai is not that Jon's Azor Ahai, it's that Bran and Bloodraven are incepting Melisandre and putting visions yeah. of Jon in her brain because Bloodraven wants Jon to be the hero and she wants to use Jon. So it's like, is is her god sending her the visions or are... Other psychic people sending her visions because glass candles can give people dreams, enter people's Is dreams. It like Urathon a... Nightwalker. Urathon Nightwalker um... pulling the strings. <laughs> so, Blood Raven being the son of a king is a prince in some sense. Was he ever promised to anyone? Was he ever promised in marriage? Maybe he no. promised himself to Shiera. I don't think Shiera ever wanted that. Yeah, promise. but no, but he did it. He promised himself. He promised himself to the Night's Watch. That is true. He swore that oath. And then ran away. A lot of people breaking oaths in this story. Mm, crazy. Wild. Theme detected. Um, <laughs> thank you, Kai, again. Um, will the Cars video essay touch... I don't know if I'm going to do it. Touch upon the Pope car inside the Pope Mobile car because it lives rent-free in my... Ba of course it's going to mention... It's going to be the crux of the essay. <laughs> <laughs> it's so obscene. <laughs> I've seen those like anatomical diagrams of what the um, anatomy and biology of the cars cars must be inside the exoskeleton. It's pretty horrifying it's stuff. It's disturbing. Yeah. And um, thank you, H Green Lamp, that motherfucker. Um, I hear that Winds of Winter is delicious. Mmm, yummy. You've wasted two dollars. Um, <laughs> we'll start a Kickstarter to pay for your surgery. <laughs> Thank you. When we have to remove the Thank winds you. of winter from your bowels. Thank you for the super chat from Kara, who says, Weird Finnish food. A loaf of bread baked full of fried herrings. Ooh. Yum, yum. Also, mami. Google it for an image. A traditional Easter food. Oh, go on, then. I don't have Google here. I, it, it, oh, you don't get Google? No, I don't get Google <laughs> Not subscribe, subscribe to Google. The, the, the bread full of herrings sounds fantastic, though. I would love that. Um... Rick Uri, thank you. Have you guys ever read The Book of the New Sun by Gene Wolfe? I think they'd be right up your alleys, our respective alleys. Mm. Um, amazing, confusing books, great for theorizing. That does sound interesting. I have heard of those books, yeah, and I heard that they do seem really cool and I would like to read them, but I haven't read them yet. They sound interesting. Thanks for the super chat from Da Big Foy, who says, Architecture descriptions next, or I riot. God, we can't avoid a riot. There's a riot no matter what we yeah. do. The tricky part is is writing a rejects search function that will find every description of a <laughs> building and architecture in the entire series. Because, like, I'll, I'll... Spoilers, but... We don't actually read through, reread the entire series every time we want to like find and find all the food descriptions. You know, we've got to find a search function that will find them all automatically. And I'm just like, how are we gonna, how are we gonna write a, a an equation that will find every description of architecture? We're gonna have to do a reread between now and our next stream. Oh which, my god! I know you talk to me about trying to make these weekly. <laughs> oh my god! Yeah. Well. Uh, yeah. My goodness. Maybe not. My goodness. Um, Marcus, does Glytus have a photographic memory? No. <laughs> I can't remember whether he does. Oh, nice. <laughs> I got him. Good one. I got him. 
Thanks for the super chat well, I from forget things all the time. Illa Goosling, who says, Glumbo, please do a music theory video. I'd go happy face. Yes. Thanks for the super chat from MHMD, who says, Why in Astapor they don't like beef and call it the savage's food? Hmm. A cow sacred in Astapor? Hmm. Probably not. We might have heard about that. No, that's just, that's just real. Lots of different countries have lots of different opinions yeah. about what is and is not appropriate food. And sometimes it's like the stuff that's easy to get is peasant food, and the stuff that's like hard to get is fancy person mm. food. And I the guess. stuff that's like from over there is barbarian food. And also sometimes the stuff that you can't get, you just say is barbarian well, food because it's sour No one wants that. Situation. Yeah, eh? sad grapes. Um, uh, Bocky Malou asks, Gleedoos, do you watch paleo slash nature slash animal YouTubers? I do. How did you notice? <laughs> Tear Zoo fan? Yeah. Oh, love me some Tear Zoo. Yeah. It's a big fan of um, PBS Eons. Ooh. Mothlight Media. Thanks for the super chat from Carver Tate, who says, Whoops, meant to make my Hello Rock from New York a super chat, so here you go. Two of my four favourite Australians. The other two are the Weekly Planet. Everyone keeps talking about this Australia place. I haven't heard of it. Is this an inside joke that we've missed? I don't, I don't, we're going to have to Google it later. Um, I, well, I mean, we'll have to use your computer <laughs> to Google. Because yours doesn't I don't, get Google. I've got to get Google. <laughs> Thanks for the super <laughs> chat from Dirk Ravensburg. What do you think will happen to the dragons? Because it's a like Dirk. No, I know, I get yeah, you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, the dragons. Oh, they're all gonna have a tea party. I think I think they'll die out. Yeah. I, I mean, like, uh, I think one of the things that I didn't hate about Game of Thrones season yep. eight was yep. Drogon flying off with Daenerys back towards Valyria. Like, that's kind of beautiful. The idea that, like, yeah, there's still like some magic out there, but you know. It's it, it's ambiguous and it's gone and it's passing on and there's a changing of the seasons, so I kind of like Drogon surviving, but I think the rest of them will die. I like that also. Thanks for the super chat from John T. Savage, who says ranking sex scenes in A Song of Ice and Fire next. Please. At least he didn't threaten to riot. Yeah, uh, yeah. thank goodness. Thanks for the super chat from John, who says listen to the first stream and some a cockabridged while road tripping to Georgia. My friend thinks I'm an insane person for listening to descriptions of fake food. I would listen to that friend. A cock abridged. We'll have to do. Oh, we'll have to do another episode of that. Sounds soon. great. Thanks for the super chat from John, who says also Shrifty got me negative riz. I wow. got too drunk and quoted the Jora line. I love her as much as I hate her. Talking about my ex to a girl I was interested in. Needless to say, it didn't work. That's weird. It worked for me. <laughs> John. I'm sorry to tell you this, but taking uh, love advice from Jorah Mormont, it's never going to work. I think when trying to riz up, you know, the, 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 the chickies on the dance floor, just try to avoid discussing your ex at all. Maybe try to avoid discussing A Song of Ice and Fire. Unless even. you've previously established <laughs> that that's a topic worth broaching. Thanks for the super chat from Noah Bathgate. Who says, love your use of Rush songs in Game of Thrones review, Gladys. Uh, I also love that. I haven't done it in a very long time because Rush, are, they, they really like to press the claim button when um, the YouTube ro robot presents them with a few options. So I might cover them in the future instead of just using their recordings. Yeah, there are so many cool pieces of music that I would love to use in videos mm. if it wouldn't get my channel destroyed. And like... You know, using wholesale a piece of music that has been recorded and them claiming that it's copyright infringement is completely valid. They are right to do that. Like that, they can choose to do that. It's not a problem at all. Um, I'm not. I'm not be bemoaning them for that at all. But here's the thing: the option that the copyright holder has is to either block your video so that no one can see it, mm -hmm. or to claim and monetize your video yep. so that they take 100% of the money that it generates. Well, 55% of it. Well, Google still keeps 45, don't they? Yeah. But here's the thing. Wouldn't it be more fair if, you know, Rush or the copyright holder could take, say, 
five percent of the money that the video That's generates. Right, because the video isn't just me uploading subdivisions to my channel, is it? Ninety-five percent of the video is still your work. Yeah. So why not make a revenue sharing system where everyone who puts work in can get a proportionate amount of the money generated? I think it'd be great for YouTube to integrate. We're just talking about other crap now. Um, to integrate a system where you can secure the rights to works through copyright holders who already have relationships with YouTube. Yeah, yeah. Why not just arrange the deal beforehand? Like, That's the to... other unstable thing. You don't get to negotiate the copyright status of your work until days after you've published the work, which is so ass backwards. And it's all up to them. Yeah, we have no power in the relationship. Anyway, yeah, yeah, I love Rush. <laughs> <laughs> um, Scott Zors says, um, Clopend... Love you guys. Thanks for everything. Sorry, you stopped my brain for a moment there. Is, is, what am I looking at? Is, is that a variation on the name Glidus that has been iterated so many times that it's unrecognizable? Clopend. I think that's kind of like gl Glidus. <laughs> In the sense that there's some consonants, a vowel, another consonant. Yes, it's closer <laughs> to the Glidus than um, Thanks again, Carver Tate. Didn't feel the need to say anything this time. Thank you, SR Rafe seventy eight, who says, "Please Google machine astroglide." We will um, we will Google that once, once we, we um, find something that has Google on it. That's correct. Thanks for the super chat from AK, who says, "Did you two read the books or watch the show first? Must get confusing if it was the show first. What about you? You go first. I, I I'm googling something. I I did it in a kind of interesting way where I I started reading book one, like after season one had came. It's a water based out. personal lubricant. <laughs> Great. Um, I don't know. Why do you think I never Google things that people tell me to Google on the internet? This is why. That's in my this is why. Now. Uh, um, I, I read the first book and then I watched the first season. Oh, I see. And then I read the second book and then I watched the second season. And then I think I like watched the third season while I was reading the third, or something like that. It's like a big I don't book. I don't remember the exact order, but I I was sort of doing it at the same time. Mm. The first few seasons and the books at about the same time. That's interesting. Yeah. I watched the show up to season five. It was 2015 when I first got interested in it. And I watched it over and over and over again. And then after that got boring, I read all the books um, before season six came out. And then I just watched the show from there. So th there you go. There you go. Yeah, I, I think that the way that I read the books and watched the show around the same That's time... That's very unique. Yeah, I, I think that it sort of made me visualize the book characters as being more like the got actors. Like, I think that it sort of made the books and the show more connected in my head. Whereas a lot of people who read all the books years before the show started, mm. they they have it more separate in their heads, the books and the show. Thanks for the super chat from Bucky Malau, who says, Alt Shaft XXX and Kana Gladys. <laughs> You just said those words. I sure did. <laughs> that's that's up there on the on the, the world now. wide web on the tubernets. Well, I have plausible. Look, here's the thing. Here's here's the other side of the coin with the AI stuff. We all now have plausible deniability. That's true. If someone ever presents an audio recording of us saying something heinous, we can always say, "Well, no, that's clearly AI generated. I never said that." Because... Yeah, I would never say something that foolish. Yeah, certainly. Uh, thanks for the super chat from Alter Swift Snow, who says, "Father." The bastard of the Dreadfort has locked me in a tower. I'm so hungry. Please send men to rescue me. Father. Uh, well, Alter, last time I checked, you have ten fingers. So, like Lady Danella Hornwood, you can keep yourself well sustained on your fingies. As long as you're there. Um, and I believe in you. I think you'll find the strength from your fingies to escape. And thanks for the ten bucks. And thanks for the ten <laughs> <laughs> Just go oh shit. I'm just gonna refresh to eh, make sure we haven't missed any. Cause I'm like that. Recent events. Don't show them all oh, okay. Yep, that's all of them. Cool. I think we're finally caught up. That's incredible. Thank you so much everybody for your kind donations. Yep, cool. And thank you for watching. This was a oh, really fun oh, live stream. Oh, oh, we gotta talk about crabs. Oh yeah, we promised some crabs. Yeah. Okay. Crab so, talk. Uh the Crab, oh, I, I did a crass to search. Uh, it's over here. Yeah. So I'll play the role of Tyrion. Oh, okay. Uh, so Tyrion uh -huh. Grint. 
I shall scour the Seven Kingdoms for dwarfs and ship them all to you, Lord Mormont. As they laughed, he sucked the meat from a crab leg and reached for another. The crabs had arrived from Eastwatch only this morning, packed in a barrel of snow, and they were succulent. Sir Alistair Thorne was the only man at table who did not so much as crack a smile. Lannister mocks us. Only you, Sir Alistair, Tyrion said. This time the laughter around the table had a nervous, uncertain <laughs> quality to it. <laughs> Tyr- Thorne's black eyes fixed on Tyrion with loathing. You have a bold tongue for someone who is less than half a man. Perhaps you and I should visit the yard together. Why? asked Tyrion. The crabs are here. The remark brought more guffaws from the others. Sir Alistair stood up, his mouth a tight line. Come and make your japes with steel in your hand. Tyrion looked pointedly at his right hand. Why, I have steel in my hand, Sir Alistair, although it appears to be a crab fork. Shall we duel? (laughs) He hopped up on his chair and began poking at Thorn's chest with the tiny fork. Roars of laughter oh! filled the tower room. <laughs> Bits of crab <laughs> flew from the Lord Commander's mouth as he began to gasp and choke. Even his raven joined in, cawing loudly from above the window. Jewel! 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 Your neighbours love you. Sir Alistair Thorne walked from the room so stiffly it looked like as though he had a dagger up his butt. Mormont was still gasping for breath. Tyrion pounded him on the back. To the victor goes the spoils, he called out. I claim Thorn's share of the crabs. What a brilliant passage. What a wonderful writer. Oh, George. Uh, thank you so much for listening, everybody. Yeah. Is there some post-amble you would like to say? Uh, not really. Um, I've ambled enough for one day as is. Thank you. Um, subscribe to channels and stuff, you know. Yeah. Subscribe to Glidus. Subscribe to Alt Shift X. Um, subscribe to someone else. Don't yeah, know who. just find someone. Subscribe. Yeah, it, sub- subscription really doesn't mean shit on YouTube, so yeah. might as well. Yeah, yeah, that's about right. Yeah, do some cardio. Um, make good choices. Or oh, and some bad ones uh, to keep it interesting. <laughs> yeah, well, you won't know which choices are the good ones unless you make a few bad ones as yeah, well. Yeah, true. You, know? you got to remind yourself what it feels like to make stupid choices. All right, we've got to stop the stream before we say something that's going to... Um... That is true, something morally objectionable. That's right. Uh, yeah, press the like button. We'll, we'll probably put this up in podcast form as well. Whoa! I know. A podcast feed? I haven't got Google, but we've got podcast stuff, so... Um... We, we've got RSS feeds. Oh, the... <laughs> yeah. It's the 90s over here. 90s? Early 2000s? When did RSS feeds happen? Uh, the 1860s. Yeah. Um, yeah, Abraham so Lincoln was killed for his podcast. Press all the, the the links and follow Glidus as a rock band on Spotify. And uh, final super chat from Carver Tate. Glidus, can you start hypothesizing which characters are crabs instead of horses? I don't think the term a crab <laughs> appears in the text. Does anyone ride a crab at any point in this story? Oh my god, that'd be so cool. We'll do some research. Like, and like the Celtigars ride into battle and ride massive Japanese spider crabs. I think there's a non zero chance that Euron rides a crab at some point. <laughs> I think it's small. It's a small chance because he has other things to ride, but non zero. Thank you, ladies Bye. and gentlemen.